Internet's we back. Yes, another week. Shouts to everybody who checked out last week's episode with my guy Loopy Blogger and the Horrible Decisions Podcast. Yes, Wheezy and Mandy. Man, let me tell you something, man. That was that was such like a, a, a left for me. Meaning like I haven't done something like that in such a long time. Just real honest talk, talking about sex, being raunchy. Like, and I told y'all, a lot of y'all, if you're at work, make sure you put headphones on or lower the volume because, you know, it was rated triple X. It wasn't no PG-13. But it was dope, man. It's such a great, great response. People really fucking with it. Like, it's funny, too, because uh, mad people had hit me and were like, um, yo, uh, dope episode. And that girl, uh, a lot of them liked Wheezy. Like, yo, I'm about to uh, slide in her DMs. I'm like, yo, fall back. So I told her that. And she had wrote back to me like, nah, let them slide in. Let them slide in my DMs. Yo, she sent me one, man. I, sh- I don't know who sent it. If you're listening, you a nasty motherfucker. Some dude's like, yo, I heard you on the Premium P show. You're beautiful and you can spit on me anytime you want. You know, I was like, oh, shit, really? Guys out here wanting Wheezy to spit on them, man. But it was definitely a dope episode. I, I, I really enjoyed, like, just the, the just the difference of like talking about like sex and 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 the difference of like how we think as guys versus how girls think, you know. Sometimes like we think as guys like that girls don't think like we do when it comes to sex. Yeah, they do. So it was dope. And shouts to them. It was a dope episode. Shouts to Loopy Blogger too. I fuck with Loopy Blogger. But uh, yeah, man. You know we out here uh, kicking it, man. And and I got some news to make, man. This Saturday. That's right. This Saturday. Okay. If you're listening. And that would be actually February 3rd. If you listen at a later date, don't even pay attention to this. But this Saturday, I'll be down in Chicago. All my Chicago internets, come out and holler at the kid, okay? I'll be at the, there's a good event going on. The score, okay? The score by Dick's, Dick's Sporting Goods in Lombard, Illinois, okay? It's at 810 East Butterfield Road. That's the score, Okay? By Dick's, Dick's Sporting Goods in Lombard, Illinois, 810 East Butterfield Road from 1 to 5. I will be in Chicago. Come holler at your boy. I'm not eating no pizza soup down there, that deep dish shit. It's, it's a joke, man. I'm not eating that. But definitely let me know where I should go eat in Chicago. At Premium Pete, at the Premium Pete Show. I'll have a chance to eat something down there. Let me know where I should go eat. Let me know where the fucking good food spots are. I need to know. Okay? Now, listen. Also, I want to tell you something, Internets. No matter what you're doing, I know there's a lot of people who hit me up talking about, like, yo, Pete, I'm trying to do something. I'm trying to work, you know, turn a lot of my dreams into reality, but it's not happening. Shit don't happen overnight. You got to stay. You got to power through. Like like, like our, our brother, Combat Jack, rest in peace, always said, you got to power through. You have to power through anything you're going through. There's going to be bumps. There's going to be obstacles, but you got to power through. You can't, you know, eat, like, like you can't expect something to just fall in your lap. You can't expect that. It just doesn't work like that. You got to get up. You got to be determined. And there's some days where you may feel like, you know, that it, it, it's really not kicking. Okay? You may feel like that. But you got to be able to power through that shit. You can't, you can't, listen, power through. And to this, I want to make sure you tell a friend to tell a friend. Make sure you subscribe to the Premium Pete Show. Follow us on SoundCloud, whatever it is. Make sure you leave a comment, too. I love seeing comments. And you know what time it is when every time I say this every week, it's time to check in. Get your phones out right now. Open your Twitter app, at Premium Pete, at Premium Pete Show. Check the fuck in. Let me know where you yo. Shouts to everybody checking in. Minneapolis always on the check-in. Nova Scotia. Russia was on the check-in last week. Uh, New Zealand was on the check-in last week. Uh, Italy the week before. People all around the world listening to the Premium Pete Show. And and I'm thankful, and I'm blessed, and I want to continue giving you this content. Athlete, artist, entrepreneur, I want to give you information. I want to give you knowledge. I want to give you comedy. And those that have been enjoying that, trust me, we're going to raise the bar. We're going to continue to bring you more and more of that. But as I said, check in. Make sure you open that Twitter app, check in. Let me know who you're listening from so I can shout you out. But also... As you check in, let me know if you want me to come to your city. If you're a city, you want a premium peace show live in your city, let me know. At me. Tweet me. So I can get to work on it. Let me tell you something, man. There's a lot of things that are special. 
But what's really special is this episode we're about to get into with the one and only Jason Maiden. Let me tell you something. If you don't know who Jason Maiden is, okay, he was a former footwear designer for Jordan Brand, but that's nothing. Here's a dude that that almost died, was on his deathbed at seven years old. At 14, seeing his friend shot in the face. Before there was even a thing of social media, was was writing letters, hundreds and hundreds of letters to Nike. He became an intern at Jordan Brand when he was 19 years old. Was be, was sleeping under his desk, was homeless, showering in the gym, met Jordan the first day, designed the Air Monarch, designed the Air Jordan 2009, worked with Derek Jeter, personal friends with uh, 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 um, Tinker Hatfield, went to school, almost had another issue, and then Phil Knight, you know, uh, let him come back to a bunch. Let me tell you something. This guy's fucking journey is inspiring. Let me tell you something. If you're an entrepreneur... This is if you're an entrepreneur in the making, if you're an entrepreneur that wants to be one, this is an episode to listen to. If you're anybody who wanted to work in a footwear business and understand the business technicalities of it and what goes on, the logistics of it, this episode for you. If you're anybody who ever thought that life was going to cut you short or you wanted to give up and you wanted more than out of life and, and, and you just didn't know how to get there, this episode is for you. Dude, wind up after leaving Nike. Okay, went out to Silicon Valley, like made his bones, d- did some venture capitalists, wound up making a brand called Super Heroic. And you know who invested in it? And who believed in it? The founder of eBay, the founder of Android, Magic Johnson. I mean, insane fucking story. Let me tell you something. And it was so good to have my brother uh, Dallas Penn. Listen to me, internets. I don't want you to ever look at a name that you don't know and think that it's you, it's the message. And if we're not here delivering the message to other people, then what the fuck are we doing? I promise you, this episode is inspiring. I dare you to listen to the whole fucking thing and tell me not. Internets, with my brother Dallas Penn in the building, I present to you the Jason Maiden episode of the Premium Pete Show. Let's get to it. Cheer. Come on, everybody, get set, let's go. It's the next episode. It's the Premium Pete Show. News, interviews, all of the info. Listen up, it's the Premium Pete Show. If you want to scoop in the low, down low. Listen to the show, cause Milk said so. Fuck what you heard, better act like you know. It's the Premium Pete Show. Internet, welcome back to another episode of the Premium Pete Show. My guy joined me, Dallas Penn. He's in the building. Bazooty. What the fuck is Bazooty? I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm loving saying that right now. Listen, I feel like, boom, that's when I get started. That's when I get ready to, to do a sneaker like, review. That's when I get ready to talk on a YouTube channel. When you turn the switch on. Bazooty. Okay, there we go. Okay. Listen, Dallas, uh, you healthy? Everything okay? I mean, listen, I, I'm here. I'm spinach? Here. You eating the spinach? I'm, I'm on a hard body vegetarian kick right now because okay, okay. I did something wrong. I knew I fucked up something. My wife knows I fucked up something. Did I drink? I did go to this Adidas do-over party and I did drink. Okay, okay. All right. Okay. I have been eating bad. I have been. Well, you got to stay I on top something. of this shit. Well, listen. Hold on for a second. My kidney just said, man, fuck you. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. now I'm taking on water. Internets. The kidney is, is pushing back right now. So now it's like, okay, calm down. Yeah. Get all of that shit correct. Mm. No bread. No rice. When I say no bread, I mean no croutons. <laughs> no, 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 none of that, none of that sl- sl- Listen, sl- slick shit. Health is wealth. You yes, indeed. That. Yes, we, indeed. We, yes, indeed. We may have waited a long time to listen to the body or listen to what it's telling us, but you out here continuing to try to stay healthy. Let me let me tell you, mental health. That's the real bread. Yeah. Okay. Uh, physical health, because honestly, frankly, man, listen, put me in a fucking cyborg. Put me in a, in, a, in one of these ill little like spider contraption machines. But if I got my brain with me, I can still fuck shit up. Mental health is is your is your real. That's where your real money vault is. True. Sure. That's okay. what needs more research. To be honest with you, but that's for a whole another episode. That's when we bring back uh, Dr. Maya Pettifit to come and talk to us. Yes. You know because we need that. But Dallas, listen. Anytime you're in the building, I, you know, internet's already know it's going to be an official one. I love to be here with you, Premium. Um. I'm I'm excited, man. I'm excited because we're trying to make this one happen for a minute. And plus, it goes down to my roots of, you know, 
when we talk about the Premium Peace Show, been able to bring people, uh, you know, stories from all walks of life. Mm. You know, whether you know you're an artist, athlete, entrepreneur, you know, um, anything, man. Really, just giving people the story behind a lot of tales of the journey that people take. Uh, today, sitting down with us, the one and only Jason Maiden. Uh, I mean, I consider a Jordan brand designer, yes. entrepreneur. Yes, sir. Uh, Did that. P- put something on your title, man. I know it's hard. When people say, yeah. what do you do? I always feel like, man, it's so much. Man. What do you say when people ask you that? Uh, first thing I tell people is that, you know, I'm Priscilla and Albert's son, I'm Sonny's husband, and I'm Kalina Viviana's father. Those mm. are the only titles that matter to me. Mm. Everything mm-hmm. else is don't matter. Mm. When people so. ask you what I do, I tell them I, I mostly breathe oxygen. Mm. <laughs> I, I, such a class question. It's a classist question. What do I do? Yeah. Well, people I, like in this day and age, keep because in mind. they want to. They want to say, "Oh, oh, are you going to be a uh, value to my yeah. to my time?" Do, you, listen, it's it's not only that. I think it, it, internet. It, uh, let me just cut cut you off okay, okay, because okay. this guest is super super special to me. Super heroic, super heroic, hey, hey. super special, man. Premium. When when you told me that uh, Jay May was going to be here, I was like, wow. I finally get to meet this brother. Years ago, um, I got introduced to him through social media, but literally his design of the Air Jordan flagship shoe brought me back to that brand. I'll be honest with you, I really wasn't, I really wasn't fucking with Jordan brand. Too tough. I felt like um, at that point, you know, the, the mid-2000s, going into the, almost the, two, the 2010s, that um, Jordan was worn by too many squares, mm, mm. too many people that I didn't, I didn't like. Mm. So I just didn't, I, I, it caused me not to like the shoe. And I found other shoes that I could be, you know, fond of as, as much as Jordan. But this 2009 shoe, I put this shoe on. And at the time, man, I probably, I'm as obese as I am now. Mm. But it, it made me feel like I could play ball. Did, did you make it the soul me, lean? It gave me the feeling <laughs> when I first put on a six. That I could do that crazy move that Jordan did, where he was like he was going dunk, <laughs> but then he pulled the ball back and then he laid up on on a leg. Remember that time he did that? Yo, it, that shoe gave me that feel. And to find out that he designed it, man, this is gonna be this is a, a joy for me right now. Sure, thanks, sure. Premium. Well, listen, let's get to it. Um, we'll bounce around and and go through your journey up, you know, cool. sideways, upside down, whatever. Let's start with the 2009. Yep. When you worked in Jordan, how long did you work at Jordan Brand? Uh, from about. About 14 years almost. Yeah. 14 years. Let's yeah. take us back to how did you even get the job? Man, I was, uh, I had been writing letters to Nike since I was 10 years old. Okay. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, a uh, neighborhood called Roseland. We mm-hmm. call it Wow Wow Hunter. Chelsea Shy Town. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wow Wow. And um, it was interesting because this was, this was pre, this is pre Google. So when you wrote a letter, you know, you had to really be confident in what you were putting mm-hmm. on paper because somebody can reject it and just blame it on being lost in the mail. So there was a whole bit of, it's a lot of bit of, Believing that I was worthy of somebody's time. I was worthy of their, you know, um, attention. And so I wrote my letters and they would send stuff back. But over the years, I learned more and more and more about different ways to get into the company. And I heard this word internship. I was reading a, a, a newspaper article about this kid, Chi Wei Lee, who had an internship at Nike. He was designing concept cars for Toyota at the time. And I was like, yo, what's an internship? What does that mean? Because they don't come to the inner city and say, yo, you want an internship? Sure, sure. Like, that's, those aren't words we hear that often. So I started to research that and understood that companies would give college students, you know, jobs to come in there for a summer and, and try them out before they hire them full time. So I was headed to Georgia Tech to double major. I was going to I wanted to make the back to the future show in real life. So I was going to do mechanical and electrical engineering. In my mind, I was Lucius Fox, the guy who was the CEO of Wayne Enterprises, designed all the gadgets for Batman. So I was like, that guy has to be an engineer, has to know how you know to build things technically. So along that journey, I just continuously stayed in touch with Nike, following up and following through, letting them know where I was at in my development. Who did you, I mean, who, did you have a contact there? Yeah. The, originally, it was customer service. They used to put, like, real numbers on yeah, the back yeah, of boxes, yeah. and I would call, and it was a person. And I, after a while, I realized I can pretend like I knew people. So I was like, oh, yeah, I'm the nephew of Tinker Hatfield. And they're like, oh, cool. I'm like, could you put me through the recruitment? They're like, ah, yo, you're like, nah, you're, you're playing us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but eventually, somebody did put me through to Elisa, Lisa Olivia. She was the head of design recruitment. And I was 16 at this time, going into my senior year in high school. And she said, well, listen, you're way too young, but stay in touch. Tell us about your progress. I took that serious. So I sent them my drawings, and I basically created a visual timeline showing them how, how I added a different skill set. Because my whole strategy my entire life is to remove ways people can tell me no. So when she said, oh, you're not good at sketching. Okay, I went and got better at sketching. You don't understand the anatomy. I took anatomy and figure drawing classes. Let me tell you something. That's, that's Jordan's growth, too. Yeah. Through his sport, 
People was like, yo, you ain't got no jumper. Yo, you're not playing D enough. Yo, you're not a team player. Yeah. But but those things either make you become that. Yeah. Or you go into a box. You break. Yeah. 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 For me, it's, it's it's I look at life as you know we talk about the concept of the alpha of omega. You know, whatever you pray to, whoever you believe in, there is this beginning and an ending. But we don't emphasize what you do in the middle. So I understand, like, all of us have a middle. All of us have this thing called life, which is a vapor. And if we are afraid to live life, then we waste this gift. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't care about what people think of me. I just don't want to waste my life being average and mediocre. Mm -hmm. So when someone tells me you can't do something, I'm like, that's your limit. That's your insecurity. I don't put that limit on myself. I challenge myself to keep evolving. So went to undergrad in CCS, wrote letters, got my internship in Jordan Brand at the age of 19. And my goal was by the end of the summer to have a full-time job because my parents couldn't afford you know, to to pay for my college tuition reimbursement. So I needed to work. So my, go ahead. No, no, I, I got to cut you off because you said you got your Jordan brand internship at 19. Yeah. That sounded simple, mm. but probably wasn't. How the fuck did that happen? Kept writing letters, kept, kept accepting rejection as a delayed yes instead of a eternal no. You know, um, they rejected me three times in college, told me I wasn't good enough. I told them that I was great enough because I believe what I can do. I wasn't going to allow someone else to tell me, that they felt I was inferior or incompetent or not qualified and um, actually flew myself out to campus, you know, before there was a thing to go and visit. I, I just got to Oregon and kind of walked around and got a sense of it, took a picture. Uh, and then I taped that picture to my ceiling. So every night when I went to sleep, I saw the campus. When I woke up, I saw the campus. It became a real place for me. Um, I like it. So you just flew out to Portland, straight up homeless and just said, you know what, I'm just going to post up. Yeah, I went out there for a <laughs> for, for, get a refrigerator for a box, live yeah. in it, and just, yeah. I went out there for three days um, mm. to Oregon, and it was just my, I literally saved my money. I was an RA in college. I kind of dipped out over the weekend, went out there and just walked around and just took pictures and just kept the photos as a reminder, like, this is a real place. And if it's a real place, then I can be there. You know, your vision is is, is amazing. And what I mean by that is you, your foresight is, is, is amazing. And, you know, who who... Who the fuck was around you that inspired you to think like that? You know, was it only just you or is there something that you feel? I, I want to know what comic yeah. you read yeah. to, to <laughs> make you understand the power of being invincible. Um, Batman. Mm. Mm. Batman. Like, so when I was seven years old, um, I had contracted what's called septicemia, which is a blood infection. And it can be fatal if not caught soon enough. And so I was something, in something like sickle cell. No, what happens is your body basically thinks its blood supply is a contaminant, so it rejects its own blood mm. and stuff. Um, and so for me, my parents discovered it in the 25th hour because you get fevers, you get sick, your body's fighting off an infection. And right at the moment before I slipped into what would have been a fever-induced yeah. coma, yeah, mm. um, they took me to the hospital. And I just remember laying at the age of seven and being hooked up to all these tubes and getting, you know, dozens and dozens of shots per day to try to figure out how to, how to you know, revive my immune system. And just hearing people say, like, if he was alive, if he made it, if he gets better. And I'm thinking at the age of seven, like, well, why is there even a, a conversation about if? What do you mean if? And when you're faced in that moment with your own mortality and you realize, like, how precious and how fragile things are, you don't walk around feeling sorry for yourself. And so I have this sense of urgency because I know what it's like to be right there at that at that great, you know, that great chasm where you get ready to fall off the cliff into mm, the, the deep threshold. Abyss, yeah. That threshold. And it's like. What do I do? Do I panic or do I just accept that all of us have this, like I said, this life with an expiration date. It's what you do with it. So literally at the age of seven, man, I just started just getting after it. And my parents, they know I, I never really sleep. I'm always asking a ton of questions. I just became insanely curious about life and Only different kid? people. No, I'm a middle child. Mm. Middle child, older brother, younger sister. Um, so I was always small, quiet. So I, I listened a lot and I learned a lot because I was small and quiet and sickly. So no one expected much. Which was my greatest kind of superpower. Were you shy? Very shy. Mm. Yeah, I was an introvert. How'd you break out of it? I just, I saw people that I admired and I told myself that closed mouths don't get fed. So either I developed a skill set to speak well or I just won't do anything in life. So mm. I forced myself. What did moms do? Uh, my moms? Yeah. So my mother is probably one of the most creative people that I've ever known in my life. She ran real estate, um, you know, uh, agencies and she worked in storage facilities but she was a she my mom is a is an empath she's a people person she mm. serves like that's her natural disposition i feel like she's a walking angel she gives everything and expects nothing my father's a military man um both of them grew up you know large families but in in the traditional kind of inner city you know family structure and they never made excuses they've been together since they were 13 and 14 um they were childhood sweethearts that have been married that whole entire time so i think 
the difference for me was the stability, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the constant unconditional love. Like they never told me my dreams were stupid. My mom would drive me around from every sneaker store. Even though I couldn't buy the shoes, she would drive me to the store so I can draw them because I just wanted to know like, what's wrong with this shoe? How could I fix it? Cause mm-hmm. every product has something that needs to be improved. And I was like, if I can figure out what needs to be improved, maybe this company will give me a job. Mm-hmm. Not the 2009. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, that's we'll, a lot. We'll, we'll get back to that. So, so, so your inspiration was when I asked you about your inspiration is that, being on a deathbed at seven, you know, yeah. um, maybe worrying about not making it. Is that, is that, is that what your inspiration has been? Because I, the reason why I ask that for is many people, um, don't mature at a young age. Yeah. Aren't like, you seem like out of college, like you had, like, even off mic, you were saying that in your twenties, you're figuring out your thirties, you're figuring out your fucking forties. I mean, I'm going to speak personally, man, for a while it took me into my thirties to, to, to become mature to yeah. stop fucking around. Yeah. I'm still trying to figure out my twenties. Exactly. Yeah. No, it was, it was, you know, my life ran in a seven year cycle. So at seven, you know, I almost la- lost my life. At 14, I saw my friend get shot in the face right oh. in front of me over a crazy argument. Two of my closest friends arguing over something silly. And one of them decides to shoot the other one in the face. Now he survived, but it's just, once again, I was reminded of just the fragility of life, man. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. in the, the moment, temporal nature of it. Temporal yeah. nature. It's like, yo, we don't, tomorrow is not promised. Today mm-hmm. is, is what we need to focus on. So from that moment, I have this urgency. I, you know, I skipped a couple grades. I took summer classes. I was a nerd that was smart, that was good at sports, that liked to draw in the inner city where I didn't look like any of my classmates because my mother is biracial. My father is, a, you know, dark skin. And in the inner city, when you're a short, sickly kid with wavy hair, like you, you may or may not, especially when you, you have to choose between do I, do I, become a tough guy so I can just walk to school just to make just to get to school I got to be a tough guy sure um how do you how do you balance that how can you like Gundam my whole life I've loved mecha and anime that's not normal that's cool now but in the early 90s late 80s that that wasn't cool no sure. I, I wanted to be a black goonie that wasn't cool you know <laughs> you know it's so crazy too growing up like so you know we grew up in Brooklyn Dallas uh, you know I mean I grew up in Brooklyn Dallas grew up in Queens and Brooklyn yep. uh, even Chicago same type of style you know it's yeah. so crazy we, we you know it's like even Dallas, like more so you and Dallas grew up like, you know, comic book nerds or, 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 or nerd. And back then we used to make fun of nerds. Like, meanwhile, the people who used to make fun of them are the fucking people who never really made it. Yeah. Well, you know? I, I won't say that, that Jay is a nerd in as much as I will say that Jay was able to geek. Okay, and, geek. But, well, but, it, but it, it's, it's different. It's different. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's one is being a student of things and and recognizing the detail in things yeah. because a, a, a geek is able to get into the details yep. of things study those details refine those details and and become a master of them because again what he's talking about is is what most uh black and brown kids in the center city suffer from mm. okay and you have the kid that's super regional that doesn't leave his neighborhood yep. but you are the kid who is has questions is curious explores wants to get outside of those confines sure. and the people in your neighborhood are like they're a little bit jealous of you and a little bit scared of you they're like what are you doing like what are you doing especially, what are you, especially the, back- here's the neighborhood the neighborhood where you can be safe and yeah. secure in this box why are you going outside where are you, where are you going sure what are you up to yeah. It's, it's weirdo sp- exactly especially back then you know like it's like even now like if you look at it like you know back then say if somebody was having uh you know organic or gluten-free people yeah. like what the fuck man you're you with all this organic <laughs> shit imagine back in the day if kale was big yeah you know what i mean like where it is now because kale's like popular yeah people are like fuck's the matter with you all this kale shit kale, yeah. kale, kale. been big man no, kale no, 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 no. collards kale listen you know yeah. they try to make kale the new kardashian yeah and it doesn't work <laughs> okay but more more so more so you know uh, um i think it's important like like i tell my daughter all the time don't look for the cool kid look for the smart kid mm. You know what I'm saying? You want to talk to all these fucking, uh, 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 you know, athletes or whatever people. Yeah. You know, that's I'm hard. not saying that's, there's nothing wrong with athletes. I love that's athletes. Difficult. That's difficult. You but know that, what I'm saying? Yeah, but that's some. That's we 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 the thing that's what you're hitting on. And I always tell my own children is we have a generation of people that have answers to questions that no one asked, mm. right? And we need to teach kids to have a little bit more discernment. So one of the things I do for you know my nieces, my little cousins, or kids that I meet is I buy them. Um, uh, memberships to museums, art museums in mm. particular. Because when you learn how to look at art and discern what an artist is trying to tell you, then you, you learn how to ask better questions. And you, you challenge what was put in front of you. And that's what graphic novels, comic books did for me. It was like they would sneak this in the whole world and nobody knew between these little thought bubbles they were telling you so much about what was happening. And then I would read and I would consume and I would learn about 
different countries and learn about different people and points in history. And I'm like, I want to go and see that because I know that the world can't just be the south side of Chicago. It can't be. There's, sure. there's somebody out there that is experiencing life at a different level. I don't want to be part of that. So by telling your daughter that, man, you know, God bless you for doing that because you're giving her permission, permission to be herself. Where the rest of the world is telling her, like, nah, I need you to fit into that fit T model demographic or not the fit T model. Maybe this little bust down model or this crazy ex-girlfriend model. But what about putting her in a position of empowerment, sure. ownership? And that's sure. what I do with my daughter. I do with my son and any kid that we meet. Sure. How, how many kids you got? I have two. A 13-year-old okay. and a 9-year-old. Life-changing, life-changing uh, uh Man, having yeah. kids, you know, um, really just open your eyes and, and make you look at life in a different lens. 100%. You know, it's, 100%. it's a special thing. You know what? Let's take it back to 19 years old, get yep. an internship at Jordan Brand. Yep. Did you meet Michael Jordan at that I time? I did, first day. Whoa. Get the fuck. It was wild. It Tell was, us how that happened. Yo, so they were they were just in the process of unve- unveiling the 16. It wasn't done, but they were doing an on-campus sales meeting. And so, you know, they had the briefcase, the whole situation. And... Yeah. You know, I'm Nike, the way it used to work, design wasn't as organized as it is today. It wasn't a function. It was part of category. So there was no true, real internship structure. So you went to the traditional onboarding with everybody else from people who had internships in sales and finance. It wasn't it wasn't a special. It, it wasn't sequestered. Really. Yeah, it wasn't so special. Everyone was kind of all together then. Yeah, I would, sit, I would sit right next to people who were getting jobs in supply chain, mm-hmm. and I'm an intern. And so what they would do is give you a map and say, okay, find your desk. And then your manager would meet you for lunch. So I get the map, and all the buildings are named after athletes, and I was dumb confused because I'm like, yo, why is the Jordan brand in Jerry Rice building? That makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> like, two different athletes. Like, mm-hmm. it's a Jordan building right there. So I'm wondering the campus, confused, and then they finally tell me where it is. And Jordan brand, I thought would have had the whole building. So I walk into the lobby, and I say, hey, I'm here, you know, Jordan brand intern. And they're like, oh, go up to the fourth floor. I get up there, and I realize Jordan wasn't, one, it wasn't the whole building, and two, it was a, a sea of cubicles that was in the back of the fourth floor of Jerry Rice. It wasn't like put in the front. It was a small group of people. I thought it was an army. It was less at that time. I think about 75 people in the brand. Mm. Very, very small. Um, so I'm going on the elevator. It's on the fourth floor, and I'm looking for my seat on this little map, and the doors open up. I look down, and there's two pairs of really nice dress shoes, and, you know, I'm really confused because this is Nike's campus. You don't expect people to wear hard bottoms. They told us, like, don't wear hard bottoms, don't wear slacks. This is kind of like sport casual. Door opens up. I see the Balutis. I look over to the right. It's Larry Miller. I'm like, oh, snap. Like, I know that guy. That's sure. the president of the Jordan brand. Like, this is crazy. Black president uh, before Barack. Shout out to Larry. Um, and then Larry wearing those extra big suits. Extra big suits. Looking like a draft pick back yeah. then. <laughs> uh, he, had that, he had that T-Mac tailor. Yeah, yeah, shit. <laughs> Uh, 50, 50 buttons on on the, on the, the front. The whole thing, twelve buttons, wide leg, you know, four pieces, navel, everything, a vest, everything, and a vest, three pocket squares. <laughs> <laughs> that boy was ready. Yep. Tearaways and everything. Well, listen, when you stay ready, yeah, you ain't got to get ready. All right. Yeah. And so to the left was MJ. So I look up, and as I'm standing there, I see him, and I I, I get nervous, so I press the the elevator button to try to close the door and pretend like I was on the wrong floor, but I pressed <laughs> the wrong button. It was the one with the forces the door open, sure, open yeah. so it's doing a little weird kind of jerk back and forth and mj has insanely long fingers so he reaches his hand through the elevator door and he's like yo are you the intern his fingers almost touched my chest i'm like oh shit this is mj about to grab my chest rip my heart out dumb nervous i'm like look sir yeah i'm the intern um and i just start blabbering he's like slow down slow down take your time i'm like okay he said how did you get here i'm like well they told me on the map to come up he's like no 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 I know where you grew up at in Chicago. How did you get here? Because I didn't know at that time, my parents went to high school with his Mm -hmm. ex-wife. My parents were part of the first class of black students that integrated Finger High School on the south side. Mm -hmm. And then Juanita had came after that. My mom was on a swim team with her. And we had figured all this out over the years that we had, you know, kind of overlapped without knowing it. But he was so confused. Like, you had, you didn't have any family last name. You didn't come from this great educational pedigree. You didn't come from uh, athletes, you know, lineage. Like, how did you end up here? Like, I want to know your story because you're, you're an anomaly. And so we talk. I tell him how I got there. Um, and at the end, I said, sir, is there anything you can tell me? What's the, what's the advice for me to take advantage of this moment? So this is the part that was crazy surreal. So the door starting to close and he waits till it gets just about three inches from closing. Doesn't even say the words or the phrase closed. And he says, don't F up. But he mouths it. So no words came out. He's like, don't. Up and then does the whole gesture like this mm-hmm. and i'm thinking like did he just did mj just threaten my life like what are we doing <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but what i understood was you know he was you know and years later we talked about it and he was telling me like 
dog, understand, like, you got here against the odds. Do not mess this up because this is not about you. If you come here and you think this is about you, then you wasted your moment. So he he really gave me this sense of leader, you know, um, servant leadership, that whenever I get to a place, it's not about what I get. It's about what I leave behind and what other people can pick up on and do better than me. So mm-hmm. I don't expect that I'm going to be the greatest at what I do. I expect that I can set the foundation so somebody can be better than me. Mm-hmm. So that's the thing I carry from MJ is like, if you're the only person that's good at something, then what's the legacy of excellence that you leave behind? Mm-hmm. And that dude really does pour into people. I mean, he oh, he paid for me to go to grad school, him and Mr. Knight. So they invest in people. And that's the one thing that I, I have actually, to Actually, about. we can't even jump over that. You, When you were working in the brand, you decided you wanted to go to school? Yeah, yeah. How, how did that even happen? Well, when I left, when I got out of undergraduate um, school, CCS in Detroit, I had talked to my advisors, and I was immediately going to go and get my MBA. And they said, well, you'll be better served getting some work experience before getting your master's. And I knew that I wanted to get my, my master's degree because I wanted to eventually start my own company. Sure. Um, and when I got to Nike, I told them, like, look, at some point I want to go and get my master's and they thought that oh yeah you know you you could do that that's cool but then as things heated up and i got back to jordan brand and and they made it a mission to say hey we want to grow the brand we believe we could be a billion dollar brand and so mj and and mr jordan and and the team they said jason if you stick around till we reach a billion and we'll support you in your journey so i kept my promise stuck around till we we cracked the you know cracked the ceiling of a billion i applied to uh you know all the top b schools got accepted into stanford and then the layoffs happened. They asked me to stay. And, you know, I had to walk on faith because I didn't have a piece of paper that said they're going to pay for it. It was all uh, uh, taking somebody's word. Well, I come from your word is your bond. Mm. You break your word. And, <laughs> right. you know, that's just, that's, you know. It's it's crazy to me that an employer, um, even though school is offered, you know, to pay for it, but that they would, like, kind of like meaning like without feeling like they're going to get used. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And, 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 and say, okay, go. And we're going to pay for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. How, how was that conversation? Yeah. So it, it, it happened over a three year period. So initially um, I was just going to leave. Wasn't expecting any tuition reimbursement. None of that. Layoffs happened. They asked me to stay because I was working on several different projects. And, you know, I turned down one school on the East Coast. Uh, really, really great business school on the East Coast. And then I also had applied to Stanford and I got accepted. You know, Mr. Knight went to Stanford. So it was crazy because they had. The person at that time, the head of HR, he went to Stanford to kind of tour and get an update about the relationship and the program. And they mentioned to him, say, hey, we got this designer, Jason Maiden. He, he just got accepted. It's exciting. Like, are you guys you know, ready to get him sponsored? Because they, they had a program that um, they didn't tell a lot of people about where they did full reimbursement. I'm, a, I'm one of the rare people that read the employee handbook. Like, mm-hmm. I read everything. Fine print. <laughs> everything. Everything. I find a loophole. I work very well in the gray area. And so it said that you needed in the employee handbook, you needed eight years of management experience before they would consider you qualified to get accepted to pay for this program. I had eight years and I had managed. I had projects. Um, what it didn't say is that they were placing people at Stanford. I went and, you know, was studying the GMAT, working on the Air Jordan, working on Chris Paul stuff, Jeter stuff, put myself in a hospital, lost vision in my left eye because I was just working so much. Like just grind it, had to get meningeal fluid extracted from my spine and check and see if I had an aneurysm. Mm. Um, like I, I working yourself to death. I worked to I worked myself to life, mm. not to death, because mm. I, I needed to do I like some, that. You know, I, I needed to do something that was going to guarantee my children wouldn't go through what I went through, mm. and I was willing to put everything on the line for that. So getting accepted into Stanford on my own merit, it was irrefutable. They couldn't say, "Oh, we placed you there. You got in." You know, I took the test. I got a tutor. I wrote the essays. I got letters of recommendation. So it became a gentleman's agreement. If you stay, we'll, we'll pay for it. And so the tab was split between Mr. Jordan and Mr. Knight. And when I left to go to grad school, I told him, I said, I want to come back. And Mr. Knight would say, well, if you come back, we would love to have you. We want you here. But you're a loyal person. And if you do decide to leave at some point, go out and do something better than the work you did here. Don't let this be the best work you do with your life. And I took that to heart. So I went to grad school. Um, at Stanford and started. How long were you there? I was there. I did the accelerator program, so a year and a half mm-hmm. and stuff. Because you know, I'm a husband with two kids. I need sure. to get back to work. Um, started a company. We were doing wearables, and we were measuring what's called muscle myography, like the vibration of fine twi- uh, of muscle groups. What I was trying to do is say, can I predict when a muscle is going to fail in real time so that athletes can slow down before they tear a muscle or hurt themselves using technology and sensors? Nike was working on a fuel band. And Mr. Trevor Edwards and Mr. Stephen Olander, who were the executives running that office at the time, uh, and Mr. Parker, the new CEO, had 
kind of caught wind of what I was doing with keeping tabs on me because they figured I might come back. They asked me to come back and lead innovation um, and strategy for the field band team, which was really cool because I got to get back in tech. And um, yeah, from there, man, the rest is kind of history. Went back to Jordan, did a ton of stuff, and then peeled out in 2012. You know, um, you speak about Phil Knight, mm -hmm. founder of uh, Nike. Mm -hmm. What is something that you learned from him that you took away? You had one-on-one -on -one conversations with him? Yeah, yeah. What was, man, it was, um, I had many. I had many, and I was very blessed and fortunate. He used to ask me all the time, or ask designers in general, because when I got there, he was sitting in design reviews. He would ask us, is that your best? Just that question, is that your best? And he didn't ask the question for you to lie. He just simply was really genuinely asking, do you feel you did your best? And if you did, okay, that's what I expect. That's what you, you know, that's an athlete mindset. Like, did you give your best on the field today? Did you give your all? And if you honestly did, any coach would tell you, like, all right, we may have lost, but, yo, if y'all if sure, fought hard. I, I live with that, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I can live with that. Um, and what I understood in that moment was, like, you know, if I give my best effort and I put my all into understanding my audience and who I'm designing for, then that's, that's the point of it all because he said one thing one time i never forget it we were sitting in a meeting and we were talking about olympic products and he says the difference between no metal and gold metal is the decisions you make as a designer and, I, and it hit me in my gut because i'm thinking all of it flashed through my mind like here's these olympic level athletes they train their whole life if and in a split second everything they hope and desire can come real or it can go away based on just a gram difference of a track spike like one gram one gram can slow a person down and all that train is out the window and just the gravity of it all, you know, realizing like my decisions aren't, they aren't just for my own taste filters because I need to design products that help these people reach their goals and dreams. Mm -hmm. So it became, design became a form of servitude and I just carried that forward into everything I do. Damn. So, Damn. You mentioned working with Jeter. Yeah. Oh, that's my guy. I love that dude. You know, um, tell, tell us moments about that. Ah, oh, man. People don't realize, man, Jeet, he's one of the, the most the kindest human beings I ever had the pleasure of working with. Like one, I think he really is the real life Batman. Like, like word up, like mm. why you say that? So the, when I had the pleasure of working on the first shoe for him, um, I used the story of Bruce Wayne and Batman. And I, I use that as an analogy for Jeter being biracial, because when you're mixed, I'm mixed, you live in both worlds. True. You know, Bruce Wayne was affluent. He was, you know, he was a leader. He was prominent. But he also was living in the underworld as Batman. So he was almost, he was ambiguous as a person like Derek was ambiguous as racially, right? Then you look at kind of like Batman's core arch nemesis. Jeter had arch nemesis in the World Series and just how Jeter sacrificed his body diving into the stands, got the stitches on sure. his chin. Batman had multiple stitches and wounds and stuff from battle. So much of the story is parallel. So then when we go to his apartment... To, to, to kind of hang out. This is, I think he was living on like the 72nd floor of one of the Trump Towers, like a beautiful view of the city. We walk in, huge wooden, like double doors. And I'm laughing to myself because I'm telling Gentry Humphrey, like, yo, this is crazy. It's like Bruce Wayne's house. We walk in, this man is standing, looking out over the city, wearing all black, black mock neck, giant fireplace, fire crackling. I see the World Series trophies, <laughs> golden gloves trophies, and he's like drinking wine. And I see his reflection in glass, wine glass over his shoulder, and he looks to the left. Um, he, and his reflection is here, and he's like, come in. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, this dude is really bad, man. I'm like, yo, if he had an Alfred, this is crazy. And comes a dude like, can I take your coat? I'm like, oh, no. Nah. This dude is really Bruce Wayne. Like the whole setup. Gita Illuminati. Man, bro, he, but then what was crazy, after we sat and played and talked, we played Miss Pac-Man for like four hours. Being like an, an, an handheld or arcade game? Like the arcade game. Oh, That's he, his favorite game. He has game. one in his house? Yeah, he had one in his crib. Um, so I actually, on one of his shoes, I hid Miss Pac-Man on the shoe um, just, cause, just to make him smile when he gets up to the plate and kind of remember that. It's just a game. End of the yeah. day, it's just a game. After we had the meeting, he's like, hey, are you hungry? I'm thinking, okay, I've worked with other athletes and entertainers. They'll probably get the food delivered. He's like, let's go. We walk downstairs. We walk for like eight blocks. He stopped and shook everybody's hand, took pictures, signed every autograph. It was just so natural. It was like, hey, G, hey, Captain, hey. And he just waved and didn't didn't even break his stride. It was just so natural for him to be in the community and on the ground. It just blew me away. Like, here's this man in New York, captain of the Yankees, which to me probably is the hardest position to hold in sure. all the sports. Sure. Like, you, 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 let me cut you off and let you know that the – greatest person to ever wear pinstripes was Derek Jeter. I believe, yeah, 100%. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, because he went through the Steinbrenner era. He survived. We never heard nothing sideways. Maybe he liked to give uh, his friends uh, a fruit basket when yes, they left yes, his crib. Before they left, yeah. With a sign baseball. That's I mean, called gratitude. Classy. That's gratitude. Classy. Yeah. classy. 
but we never heard nothing sideways about this guy. And not and not only that, but yo, he got through that era of New York. Yeah. Where other guys, great athletes, get eaten up, get yeah. eaten alive. Yeah. You know, yeah. You, you make a great point, Dallas, because there are look, Boston Red Sox fans have told me Jeet is a class act. Mm-hmm. Boston Red Sox fans don't give no credit to no Yankees, Absolutely. and neither do we give them. Boston Red Sox, you you leave any Boston team, and they will burn your jersey. Yeah, yeah. but but they, they, they will they will hang an effigy of you and burn it. <laughs> <laughs> think about it. When Ma- he, meanwhile, you helped them win. Exactly. No, but think about it. When he went on his um, you know, was yeah, it tour. farewell tour? Yeah, they was stand up applauding for him. Everybody crying. Every stadium. You know. You know. One thing I learned about you in a short amount of time before we went on air. Um, you're a network guy, man, and you know uh, I I know a little about you over the years. Like I said, I think we met back in a, a, a shoe game party in G Rock yep. in Atlanta. Do you do you still okay? Some people work in the business, like yeah. meaning like they may be lawyers or artists or 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 PR people. They're like, oh, I worked with Jeter. They don't really know Jeter. Yeah, yeah, you know, people may say like I worked with Kanye, but they may have just sent the facts over. Yeah, like did you really work with him? Does he yeah. remember who the fuck you are? And I'm not saying that yeah, for yeah, Jeter. Yeah. Uh, as you moved on and 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 be, you know his entrepreneurial lifestyle, mm-hmm. do you still stay connected to people like that? Like, do you have Jeter's number? No, I don't have Jeter's okay, number. Okay. No, we because get I, you that. no, because the thing is, I told I told them from the beginning, I'm not here to be your friend. You have friends. Mm-hmm. That's not my role. My role is to give you a series of weapons that you choose, and those weapons will help you either beat your competition or fail. That's mm-hmm. it. That's mm-hmm. my job. I'm the I'm I'm the Lucius Fox. I'm the gadget guy. I knew my role. I didn't come in there trying to befriend them. I just want I just wanted their respect. Mm-hmm. That was it. I, don't, I got friends of my own. Sure. Like, I don't need to hang out no, with you. No, I don't really mean that. I mean, like, even, yeah. you know, like, like, and we'll get to it, even when you talk yeah. about starting, you know, your own brand with Super yeah, Heroic, yeah, yeah. how you were able to combine friends to mm. be investors or oh, people yeah, yeah. who believe in you. That's why I mentioned Jordan. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's what just, about Jordan? You got him on speed dial? I have, I have his information. Yeah. Okay, because okay. it's respect. That's yeah. the thing is they, they see, you know, my natural disposition is, is servitude. Like, how I met Dallas is because I was volunteering at Cooper Hewitt to talk to kids. Mm-hmm. I met Joel when he was in high school. Mm-hmm. What teas you talk about? Uh, no, Joel Rodriguez. Joel, oh, yes. Thomas, 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 Thomas Truth. Truth. Shouts to Thomas Truth. Uh, again, yeah. again, we're, we're all connected under the sun. Yeah. And, and Thomas Truth was like, yo, you love the 2009 Yo, you gotta holler at this guy. You gotta follow this man. Yeah. J. May Shy City. He's the designer of the shoe. And d- just like that, boom, that's. How I got connected to Jason. Yeah. You know, I, I want to pull it back to your shoe. I'm yeah. sorry about that. We, we, we're hopping all over the place. We're hopping all over the place. Um, inside the insole, you have a Zoom Air unit yep. embedded in the insole. Yep. What was that? So the whole, sh- the the hypothesis for the shoe. What did you say? Hypo- hypothesis. Okay, okay. Right, because every, <laughs> every shoe is a science project when mm-hmm. you start it, right? And you got to have something to test. So I was testing, can we make a shoe that improves somebody's ability to play defense? Because MJ, even as an offensive player, he moved defensively. And so I always look at analogies. I look at things that could be parallel, and I try to connect the dots. And so if you understand martial arts, martial arts is the manipulation of small distance between two human beings. That's defense. You have to anticipate a person's body in motion and then manipulate it to your advantage. You know, it's the, they call it an economy of motion, which is a phrase that Bruce Lee coined, where how many steps will it take for me to defeat my foe? It should mm-hmm. take less than three. If I'm really efficient, three steps, boom, 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 I'm done. So I looked at MJ and how he played. He covered so much ground. I watched hundreds of hours of him playing i saw that tape of tape Mm -hmm. watching him shorten the distance it took for him to get from the three-point line to the basket and over time when he was able to navigate the game he went from six to seven steps to three he was very efficient how hard is it to design a shoe for jordan when you never designed when he was playing you know yeah i mean you know you have to look for stories that were untouched you have to look for narratives that were you know, unexplored, and you have to also look for attributes that you can amplify. So defense was an attribute that no one had ever talked about that Michael had. Every every one of his shoes was based on his style of play. I was like, well, what about his style of defense? Because that man was a predator. He got lower than anyone else on the court. That's why he got his nickname Black Cat. Mm -hmm. Like he was, I mean, his ability to get lower than someone that was smaller than him. If you see him guarding Allen Iverson, and you see Allen Iverson dribbling the ball, MJ's lower than him. And when you able to get lower than your opponent, and that's that's he, he got lower than Muggsy Bowles. Muggsy Bowles, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Muggsy. How you how, I know, how are you gonna do that? That's what I'm saying. Like, and Muggsy is five what three? Right. And Mike is down there stopping five one maybe five Mike, one. Mike had the limbo. Mike was out there doing cha cha slide. He was doing <laughs> split. He was, and so understanding that that man was a better defender than offender 
um, we wanted to put something in the shoe that helped with the heel to toe transition to have him turn around off of offense or rebound, whatever, and then get back to the spot, like beat his opponent to the spot. So that's the premise of propulsion. Can I propel him to that place before his opponent gets there? So it was the foundation of what became the flight plate, played at Zoom, like all this stuff. That's totally, that's totally what that Zoom Air unit did. I mean, literally, uh, uh, imagine a fat dude who had this new uh, uh, bounce in his step. I mean, this shoe gave me an incredible bounce in my, and, and, and I said it made me, for the first time, really have to examine. I was like, what is this? And I, and I took that insole out, and I was like, oh, snap. Because that tech was typically built into the platform of the shoe. Yep, yep. You can activate it all the way. Let me ask you something. Do you, do you um, when you design a shoe like that, you know, and I believe that shoe made it to the outlet, mm-hmm. do you take that, not you only personally, yeah. does the brand take that as like, you know, a loss? No, I, I don't. I mean, you know, the reality of it is I know there's only, I think, what, seven people on the planet to say they can ever design an Air Jordan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and when I had the chance to design the Air Jordan, I was 27, 28. I was relatively young, made a lot of mistakes. It was designed by committee, but I still feel blessed that I had the opportunity. You know, yeah. I can't get points for yesterday's game. Sure. So I got to just look at what it did for me, what it taught me. Sure. Uh, you also designed uh, another shoe that uh, may be the uh, dad sh- goat <laughs> shoe uh, uh, of all time, the Nike Air Monarch. Yeah, yeah, How, yeah. how did that even Hold come on about? for a second. Well, you're, the, you're one of the designs for the Air Monarch. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the goat dad shoe. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was actually my first shoe, my first official shoe as an employee. Listen, take us through how that happened. So, um, it, it's interesting. So when I got to Nike, they had this program called the Bench, and it was for people that were polymaths, like people who had different skill sets. And because I was a cobbler and tinker, I would make my own technology and hack stuff together. Um, they were like, well, let's put you in this rotational program and have you work on everything. Because I had a, a minor in graphics, graphic design, illustration, and then in, a major in industrial design. So I was doing logos for athletes and branding strategies. And then I did this project called The Monarch. The first one was done by Rob Dolan, and it was competing neck and neck with New Balance. It was like, mm, it was still they were still fighting over this white leather business. And they were sure. like, we need the second one to crush it because we need to separate ourselves. But what was funny is... Nobody wanted to do it. It was so undesirable. It wasn't the shoe with the budget of, you know, marketing. There was no athlete attached to it. Excuse me. <clears throat> it was just a product. And people were like, yo, it's just a foot covering. Don't don't overthink it. But I'm like, look, this is my first opportunity. Sure, sure. And I if I if I and I'm a big believer if you do the small things exceptionally well, small things done well over time is what leads to greatness happening. I can't just show up and say, I'm gonna give my best effort when the lights are on. I gotta give my best effort when no one's looking. So I gave my best effort, I recreated you know, a man cave. I had like wood paneling on the wall, Budweiser signs, like Green Bay pack of cheese heads, Dunkin' Donut boxes, like recliner chairs. I kind of mm-hmm. just put the whole vibe out there. Like this is for the everyday guy. This is for, you know, your but favorite. you did that in the office? I did it. I took over a conference room. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And just recreated his environment because I needed to get inside of his mindset. Like mm-hmm. what decisions is he making? How does he feel per day? You know, when he comes home from work, what's the number one thing he wants to be? If he was to describe this shoe, what word would he use? And it was comfort. That was it. That was the innovation. How do we make something that's extremely comfortable? And um, I just obsessed over comfort because what people don't know is shoes have budgets. To design a shoe, you're given a budget. It's called an FOB. What kind of budget uh, did the Monarch have? I think at that time, the Monarch was like nine or ten bucks to make. Like mm. it was, it was, it wasn't a, it wasn't a lot of money that we can spend because I think when it originally came out, it was like forty nine ninety nine. So you know, you sell wholesale. Sure, you maybe twenty bucks. Yeah, right, right. I mean, bucks, I mean that that, that shoe <laughs> yeah. is in Sears. That shoe is in J C Penney. Yeah. I mean, it, it is ultimately though the the highest selling shoe yeah. for the brand. It is, it is. You know, but the shoe. But you're right. That shoe is ubiquitous. Yeah, yeah. But it but it it amplified the archetype of a father, and the father in connection with the word comfort was important to me because you know I have a father that was in my life that while having his own individual struggles when not, you know, his father passed away when he was younger, he still found a way to provide and show unconditional love to us and teach us how to be a man without ever really having an example himself. So I thought about what does the role of the father really mean and how can I provide a place of peace for this person when they come home from a hard day at work working in a factory? Because these are Midwestern men. That's who I was designing for, Midwestern men that I grew up around. You know, my fifth grade teacher, Mr. Fiegel, or my, my high school art teacher, Mr. Summers, or football coaches, like these guys who, who you know, who who just have this sense of they're the everyday man, like Dan from Roseanne, the everyday mm, guy. Mm, mm. Um, 
Damn, so, that's classic. I, I could see him that was in my muse. Air Monarchs, man. Yeah, that's the muse. And, and people laughed and they clown me. And I told the whole story of how, you know, in the morning how he wakes up. He has his routine. He gets his Dunkin' Donuts coffee. He reads the paper. Sure. He sees his kids off to school. And people are cracking up. i never forget it. And Charlie Denson and Mr. Knight were in the room. Charlie Denson is the former president of Nike. And everybody's laughing at me like, dog, you went way too deep. Because I started talking about, like, the moisture on the grass and how we can add this layer on the, on the leather so he can easily wipe his shoes because he's only buying one pair per year. And we need this and we need that. And mm. we need to have widths because his feet are wider because yes, he's indeed. a bigger guy. And, sure. and everybody's clowning me like, dog, you treat this like the Jordan. Mr. Knight and Charlie Denson was like, yeah, he should. Mm. He should treat this like the Jordan. And you should treat every shoe like this. Because if you care that much about a shoe that don't, doesn't have mark in it, what, what is he going to do when we give him a budget? What is he going to do when we put the lights on him? He's going to perform. And I think that's what earned me my reputation is because I took something that nobody else wanted and I poured my heart and soul into it. Mm. And I appreciated the opportunity. And at the same time, you know, I jumped in and, and did a bunch of graphics for, you know, to help them recruit athletes. So it was a unique situation where I inserted myself in areas where I thought I can provide value and then I took the smallest task and made it something meaningful because I cared about taking advantage of my opportunity. You know, the Nike Air Monarch you designed yep. with, along with some other people? Yep. Okay. You know, we, we were speaking about this, and, you know, in the future, can you ever see a, a footwear brand giving a percentage to the person who designed it? Because if you think about it, yeah. you really only get the fame. Yeah. You know, you leave the you leave the job space and you're like, oh, you know, one of the designs I did was an air monarch, but you don't get anything from that. Uh, what, what, why why can't you get 2% of the shoe or 1%? Of the, you yeah. know, shouldn't that be something that could happen in the future? 100%. I think, I think you see that model already taking place with the collaborations. Mm -hmm. You'll have people who own their own fashion brands doing collaborations with bigger companies. They give them fixed amount of money. Um, they don't do, some of them do revenue sharing, but most of them just give them traditional like capped income. This is how much you make, move on. I think the new model that's going to emerge is if companies want to really be ahead of a trend, if companies want to be res you know, responsive instead of reactive, you're going to have to be willing to work with people who are going to float between all three. Mm. It's just that simple. You need hired guns. And these people should be able to come in, inject a certain, you know, a different level of thinking, bring in new processes, new methods of making, new ways to create, new ways to connect to culture, because the people who create culture – we don't want to be trapped inside of corporations anymore because mm -hmm. they just extract the value out of us and put us in rooms and say, you're no longer cool. You taught us how to speak to your people. So now we can go out and culture vote you and appropriate everything you do and then just pretend like we know and we don't know. So they're going to have to start to really be comfortable with working with people who are non-employees. You know, tell, tell me uh, if you agree with this. You know, I feel like for a long time, um, Nike was, um, you know, they, 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 Gave people the joy of making their own shoe, but never yeah. wanted to give money for it. I'll explain to you. Yep. I remember Bun telling me a long yep. time ago, they made a shoe for Pimp. Yep. Uh, I forgot what it was. And he was like, yo, Bun, we official now. Jordan Brand made us a shoe. Like We have our own shoe. They made him like a one-off, I believe. Yeah. And that's how, you know, when we're from the hood, where we grew up, like, we got our own sneaker. Like, oh, she has everything. But what about some money? Yeah. And I yeah. think that Adidas, and, and correct me wrong, not, you know, I, I'm, I'm a fan of all brands. But I think Adidas doing collaboration and giving people, cha like, with two chains and push yeah. and giving them, like, yo, you may not be an athlete, but you know what? We're going to break bread with you. Absolutely. And I feel like Nike was like, we'll give you the sneaker. You know, uh, you know, you could give, like, 40 to your friends and... You know, yeah. we're going to collect all the money, though. You ain't going to get it. Well, I think that that's what Jay is saying. Jay is yeah. saying that the model is changing. No, no, changing. I know that, but I'm saying even, like, you see Adidas doing it. You know yeah, I mean? yeah, but yeah. The, the thing about it, and, and this is the reality, is, one, we have to we have to call it what it is. People buy their way into relevancy. Mm. Because so many people are afraid of not looking cool. They associate themselves with whoever's cool at the moment. The most, the coolest thing ever is when you just 100% yourself. Like, nobody goes and tells Nautica, stop working and doing stuff with boats because we need you to be focused on hip-hop. Nautica's like, nah, we make our products, we do, sure. you know, or in, people create SUVs because they hope you take them off-road, not to just flex driving down the street and put rims on your car. So I think the purity of innovation is always going to be about form over function. So a lot of the companies, when they do start to sign, you know, entertainers, what they do have, what people need to realize now is that the role of the athlete is now equal to the role of the entertainer. They're no mm. different. Kids can go on social media and see like King, you know, King Batch with a million followers or King Bach, however you pronounce his name. Apologies if I, if I butchered it. Um, he has a million followers. So therefore he's equally as valuable as LeBron. He's equally as valuable as Beyonce. He's equally as valuable as Russell Westbrook because he has a following. And so these kids are now seeing the democratization of greatness. You don't have to have a jump shot. 
creativity was my jump shot. That mm-hmm. was it. I don't have to have a post game. I have to have a post game on IG. Like, it's different. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's different now. That's classic. You know what I'm saying? It's different. And so now when you make greatness accessible and you could be accepted and be well-known for being yourself, companies have to shift the paradigm because they put they put greatness out of reach. And then they say, oh, you can't be like Mike, but you can buy a portion of his greatness. You mm-hmm. can't be like LeBron, but you can get a portion of his greatness with this product. Now it's like, no, actually, you can be in the same room with that guy and literally all you do is post videos. Mm. And that's a valuable thing today. So companies got to, you know, they have to shift because if the, and that's where Super Rock comes into play because for us, we realize the dying archetype and role of the athlete evolving. So what's left? Kids now aspire to become superheroes. All of our lives were set up around sport calendars. We knew in June the finals was happening. October was the World Series. January, February was the Super Bowl. We knew all these dates because of sport. These kids know that Comic-Con is in July if you live on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. E3's in May. Like Mm -hmm. (laughs) Sneaker Con is coming when it's coming. You know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So their their, their social calendar is based on these very obtainable narratives that are driven through the archetype of a superhero and imagination. You see all the movies that come out are, what, either a remake of an old comic book-ish movie or a literal translation of a graphic novel. So this era of kid is growing up with that being the hero, not the athlete, the superhero being the hero. Mm. And then technology shifts our ability to communicate intergenerationally because of tech and how it's, you know, giving people access to info. All this stuff is happening together for the first time with little kids and older people. And we're saying that if you look at the what we focus on, which is play, play is a universal language. It's the bridge between, you know, your, you know, when you start crawling and when you start dunking, it's the thing that gives you performance. So if you play and have a, 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 a healthy play habit, it develops you into being a person that is well-rounded. And so whether or not you want to be an athlete or you want to be an entertainer, play is just your foundation. So that's what we obsess over, man, o- like really owning that, that precious age of, you know, 4 through 11 where kids are willing to just be themselves. They wear pajamas to school. I mean, they, they paint their faces. They wake up, roll out of bed, don't brush their teeth. They don't really care about what people think about them. They're just a kid. So damn, want... I, I do that shit right now. Guess <laughs> because you're a big you're fucking a kid. kid. Well, I'm, I'm I'm the Black Peter Pan. Yeah. That's it, man. That's it. But we got to protect that because we keep killing our kids' ability to be children, and we tell them that we need them to step up and do more. But then we don't equip them to do it. Mm. You know, we 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 atrophy their ability to have some such sense of grit. They're trained to just give answers to questions instead of knowing how the problem actually works. I, it, we're turning them into robots, man. We're rushing towards real life Wally, mm. where these kids just sit with virtual reality goggles and, and then float around. They don't know how to cook, can't drive, don't know how to read, mm-hmm. don't have to research anymore. Well, worse than that, don't know how to interact with don't other to kids. Because we taking away Don't play. know how to play with other kids. Yeah, bro. You remember when we were kids, you get that knock on the door, can, can Dallas come out? Yeah. Like yeah. That, that was the pool model. S- like, yeah. Somebody, somebody, somebody do a rock at the window, Yo. somebody rang that buzzer, you know, and then not only that, but. I'll, I'll never forget, man, when the street light came on in the summer. Get home. All right. You was outside all day when them street lights came in. Don't have nobody come outside, call your name. Or, yeah. or, or mom just saying, you know, dinner time. I remember when she used to call for dinner. I was like, yeah. damn, man, the, the night's over. Like, I may <sighs> not make it back out. You it's know? a wrap. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing. Let's take a quick break. Yeah. Uh, sitting here with the uh, uh, former Jordan brand designer, entrepreneur, uh, extraordinaire, uh, creative. <laughs> Jewel dropper. Gr- yeah, and, 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 and mo- most importantly, a uh, uh, people person. Mm. Jason Maiden. In, in service you, of others. Dope. Dallas Penn's in the building. You listen hey. to the Premium P Show. We'll be right back. Internet. Yo, what's up, man? This is Smush Parker from BK New York. Stand up. You checking out the premium Internet? And we're back, sitting here with Jason Maiden, the one and only. That's a that's a cool name, Jason Maiden. Uh, appreciate it, man. Thank you, you think about it, right? Yeah, that's a super heroic name, right there. Jason Maiden. You know, anytime you have <laughs> alliteration or rhyming in your name, it's like now now you got to do something. That's right. You know, now you got now you got now you got to put a cape on. Now you got to you know some. Yeah. yeah. Hey, hey, listen. Right, on, we got to get into this. Jordan Brand. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel like when we were growing up, there was better materials in the Jordans. Yeah. Then I feel I always use this uh, mm-hmm. analogy that people stop fucking hooping in them, yeah. and Jordan Brand caught on to it. This is just my analogy, yeah, yeah, yeah. and was like, you know what? We we're gonna make we're less materials. Mm. Do you believe in that? No, no, because okay. I, I understand the um, what happened, you know, behind the scenes. So. There were less restrictions with what chemicals you can put on materials when we were growing up. So you could take a synthetic or a leather and add a lot of toxic stuff to it because we didn't know how harmful it would be, right? Like the coverings, the finishing, like people didn't know 
early on, like aerosol cans when you spray your hair. Now they're saying that created a hole in the ozone layer. These, sure. these are things we didn't know, but it took time to get the data to realize the damage we were doing. Same thing with material science back then. So while you may feel like the, the materials back then were better, they're actually in the long run were more harmful. So the stuff they use today, the glues, the, the glues the, and all that stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's less toxic and mm-hmm. stuff is the material actually. Oh yeah. You're using organic glue now. Uh, water based. Okay. They use water based solvents. Gluten free. Yeah, G- non GMO, farm raised glue. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Free range glue. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm playing around. <laughs> but I, but but you you, you got to understand that I'm sure you heard this before. Yeah. You get Jordans now. Sometimes the glue shows. Yeah. I just feel like yeah. it was more. Don't get me wrong. It was wrong. more craft. Yeah. It was more craft back then. Why, why is that though? Well, I think. A lot of it, there probably were... First of all, there was less product. I'm, I'm sorry. Listen, I mean, you weren't in the fucking building. I, th- there was less product being made, ultimately, back mm-hmm. then. It's the throughput. That's what happens in supply chain. If you take, let's say, you know, uh, a crazy sellout shoe, it maybe had, would have been 100,000 pairs back in the day, right? It wasn't the high demand, so you can walk into a full locker three weeks after release and still get it. 100,000 was sure, a lot of sure, units. Sure. With 100,000 pairs, that means that each person on the factory spent more time constructing it. Now you say, no, nah, we need a million pairs. That's less time that each person has to touch it and finish it. Sure. So it's the throughput. How many can I get through quickly to reduce my cost? Because the longer it takes in the assembly process, the higher the labor, which then impacts the price of the sure. shoe. So when you had less pairs being made, you had people that were able to really craft and finish. Because it's still about 90% hand done. Mm. The footwear industry, which is amazing. Yeah, it isn't really automated as much as people think. So it's, the, it's how many pairs are out there and the fact that we got the, you know, the Pokemon collector mindset now where they just got to get them all for no reason. They just want to have them to flip them or just to say they got them. It's driving down the quality because they're trying to quickly make stuff. True. Do you think that uh, when people say, you know, Adidas jumped over jump, man, do you think that Adidas put pressure on Nike? Like, meaning, like, you think they really, like, like you know, in the office are like, yo, what the fuck is going on? Reason why I asked you yeah. that for is because, you know, like Nike are in the back. I never, listen, mm-hmm. I remember... I, I'm from the days of collecting from the beginning days, yeah, yeah. buying, copping. Yeah. I never thought the Nike Air would ever come, come back. back on the Jays. Yeah. And I always felt that Nike or Jordan brand had a, like a, if anything goes wrong, we could always just go back to using Nike Air because it, it, it it's still hot. Yeah, it's still yeah. Cindy Crawford. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and, and. Well, Cindy Crawford from 85 though. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, I'll, that's still, Cindy Crawford. I'll, still, I'll still, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but okay. you, now with that yeah, same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, but the Nike Air strategy that they wanted to put that in play. Almost eight nine years ago. So you don't think mm. that's like a, a, a nah. A, what would we call no. that? Like a react- yeah, reaction. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't a reaction. To, yeah. No, it wasn't a reaction. It was, it's, been, it's been in the works for a long time, and okay. it just came down to MJ and his approval rights and stuff, like contractually, like how to perfectly time it and roll it out. So that part isn't in relation to to the Audi piece. What I do think happens, and one, let me let me break down. I guess people need to understand the scale. So Jordan is until this year was a category considered a category underneath Nike's mm-hmm. business number. Even though we said it were a division or a brand, it functioned like a category of about 150 people. Adidas is a corporation yes. of about 30,000 people. So when it, jumping over a 150 employee organization as a 30,000 person company, I think the better way to frame it is Adidas finally realized the muscle it had and its potential, and they ca- like capitalized on that potential. Because sure. Adidas is a damn good engineering company. You can't take that away from it. They build world-class product sure uh, i mean they were putting mechanisms and shoes and motors and shoes a decade ago 12 years ago you know with some of the adidas running product so they've always been proficient in making great stuff they just weren't great storytellers and with the addition of great storytellers the pharrell's the yays you know um even some of the design talent that came and over the boost technology the boost technology it's the perfect storm people wanted to see themselves in a brand and that's what adidas has given them it's about creativity that whole notion of calling all creators this is a creative culture because you got all this information Tech is primarily ubiquitous in like first world nations, first world countries. So now these kids want to create. That's it. I want to make stuff. I want to make stuff so I can get attention. I want to be myself and be loud and be, and be and care about who I am. And Adidas just right time, right brand, right set of people. Because a lot of it is luck. I can't. I can tell you right now. There's no person like here's the right moment to drop this. Con-. No man, it don't work that way. A lot of it is luck and taking advantage of that little window of time where you see an opportunity and it just ran through. And you are so far ahead. Like for instance, like uh, how many years ahead is Jordan working on? Like what are they working on? Man, usually anywhere from about about two to about fifteen years out. 
That's fucking crazy. Yeah, because some stuff is the 15 yard projects is when you're changing an entire method of doing something. You're inventing new machinery. You're trying to get government approval because you're changing the way that certain solvents are classified. So those are the long lead innovations that take a lot. Good example that is shocks. Shock was in shocks was in, in the works for 10, 15 years before I even got there. It was something people have been trying to crack the code on for a long, long, long time. You know, it took me a long time to uh, enjoy the Nike Shock, and it's crazy. Now when I look back at it, I'm like, damn, that shit was kind of garbage. Because, you know, of what they have today, I'm like, you know, I'm like, man, that Boeing type yeah. style they yeah. were trying to call it. Like, Yo, my, my dream is, is for Nike to finally evolve into its ultimate form. Yeah. And I, and I get me a box of Nike Air. Mm. Yeah. And I open up that box, and there's nothing inside there yeah. but Nike Air. Mm. You know what Nike Air smells like? Yeah. It smells like Sequoia. <laughs> and Tinker Hatfield farts. <laughs> mm, Let me ask you something. Yeah. What's your relationship with, 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 like with uh, Tinker? Uh, Tinker Hatfield. Uh, Tinker was, I would say, one of my probably greatest like design mentors when I first got there. Um, I spent a lot of time watching his process because I wanted to mirror how he worked with athletes. You know, he had he one he had the permission and the clout to be able to talk to anybody he wanted without oversight. So that was helpful. Tinker, you know, he earned his reputation. Um, I also want to mention that there's another gentleman that's equally as valuable as Tinker but never gets mentioned, who's Wilson Smith. Mm. Wilson who's Smith, that? Wilson Smith is the Benjamin Banneker of footwear design. Mm. Every single Jordan product, you know, that or every Agassi, anything that you see that came out of that era when Tinker was really popping, Wilson was somehow tangentially connected to it, if not a major part of that process. So mm. shout out to Wilson because without Wilson, Tinker wouldn't exist and vice versa. Mm. Um, go ahead. No, there's oh, a, yeah. th- listen. Okay, finish. Oh, yeah, yeah. But Tinker, though, I, you know, Watching how he worked with athletes, how he asked questions, and how he studied them, that was the one thing I took away from him. And he's been able to work with Mike, so he's probably... You know, it's crazy, too, because when I, when, I, when I think... I was telling Dallas this. When you think about Jordan brand designers, yeah. no one could really top Tinker. You know, like, there hasn't been, like, a super uh, famous type yeah. designer after him. Not saying nothing yeah, about... Yeah, you, yeah, like, yeah. You're creative and you're doing major things, yeah. but as far as popularity to, like, yeah. people knowing yeah. like that, he, I mean... This it was you know well I guess I have to break it down this way when you're allowed to have unrestricted access to a person and you're given the opportunity to have that person provide insight and feedback in real time unfiltered you can design with pure intentions when the projects are passed off to anyone but Tinker you have a million different executives holding your hand telling you what they think it should be. Mm-hmm. because when Tinker's working on it, you can't tell him anything because his, his relationship with Mike is so strong. And let's not, let's, let's be honest. Mike made that shoe. That shoe without Mike is just a shoe. Right. If Mike went to three stripes instead of Jordan, three stripes would have been a brand. Oh, that with. is a great, that is a great, uh, facts. Man, fact. No, no, you're right. But what, 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 what could it have been if Mike signed to Adidas? I mean, I think honestly, Nike would be, it would be role reversal. Nike would have figured it out. Cause remember they still had Deion Sanders. Mm-hmm. They still had Bo Jackson. Now you had an incredible state. They, 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 had, had, they had Charles Barkley. Yeah. The 90s basketball era would have still happened, but what they didn't have was this once-in-a-lifetime personality, like a Michael. Michael was, it was he was everything that was right about the 90s. Well, well uh, Mike, Mike was certainly a linchpin yeah. and, and part of the last era of athletes uh, uh, generating sneaker sales. Yeah. But I, I, you know who I really give the credit to? Uh, from like Whedon and Kennedy. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Advertising agency. Yeah. Them creating the, the emotional connection yeah. that we have. I mean, the the Bo Nose campaign. Yeah. Yeah. Spy, the school, the stay in school. Stay in school, that. Spike Lee, Agassi. You, but, so, but you also got to shout out Gatorade. Mm. Gatorade did a lot during that period to, to also be the, the bookend to Nike. You know, it was like these two companies telling this story of athleticism and potential. Because the Be Like Mike campaign, that was Gatorade, if I recall. Mm-hmm. You know, so <laughs> it, made, it made, it humanized a superhero like it made michael it gave michael the clark kent type of vibe like yo he's a regular guy even though he's supernatural and gave him the access gave yeah. him that access to us yeah yeah, yeah. And, then, and then only i mean it also helped that mike would play pickup ball in a shot and destroy he was a better like street ball player than organized ball player like mm. that man was an assassin on the Did board. you ever play against mike nah we i mean he he didn't really by the time i came to the brand like it was more shooting around with, you know with employees but he wasn't in that competitive mindset but he competes across the board golf bowling whatever it is he'll compete with you i would have had love to play with, against him or with him when he was like really really in shape and killing it True. Sure. just oh, to watch oh no no you wouldn't have i no, would oh just to study it he was he was an animal just to study it though man like i saw him when i was a kid play pickup on the beach like i saw him play you mm-hmm. know that whole love of the game clause so in the shot i saw him play pickup mm-hmm. but i was a kid and it's like you know your memories are 
exaggerated when you're a child. So if I could see it as an adult and I was able to really study him, ah, man, I would have loved to love to do that. You know, do you think that, um, you know, people die to work for Nike? Yeah. It's like a dream job for many, even mm-hmm. Adidas, but they got to move to Portland. Yeah. You know, is is that tough, you think? Extremely. For yeah. Extremely. When I moved to Portland in 1999, um, people were still calling me colored. Mm. And that was a very interesting experience. You know, <laughs> walking down the street, coming from Chicago, undergrad in Detroit, and people say, oh, hey, my boyfriend's colored. Maybe you guys should hang out. I'm like, no, I'm not really into, like, colored people play dates. But I understand, <laughs> you know, what, what you're doing. But no, thank you. But that was a real thing. Oregon, you got to realize the history of the state of Oregon and, and, and how it was founded as a state and what its state constitution literally said. It was, it was supposed to be a complete separatist movement away from any diversity it was supposed to be like the purest state in the union that was intended for one type of person and up until i want to say almost as recent as like the 1980s people of color couldn't own property so it's a very weird state history uh people there are very well read but they don't travel a lot so you'll have these deep philosophical conversations with folks about things that they've never physically experienced like oh man the situation in tibet is crazy where have you been in tibet nope but i read about it and it's crazy. i'm like so why are you you know, so when I got there, it was a lot of that. It was a lot of like talk soup and people who read about things but never experienced it. That worked there. That worked there. See, you know what? You know what? That, that that's a great point. You know, I want to say many years ago, I remember meeting a bunch of different Nike people, and you know, uh, me excited to meet them um, because you know it's like, oh, they work for Nike. It was almost like they said, like, oh, we work for Nike. It was like yeah. a big deal to say that. But you know what I learned over the years is a lot of people who work in Nike who have no idea. They What's going on? It. So they used to send, like, I remember, like, Chris, Chris Vidal. I don't know if you're mm-hmm. familiar with Chris Vidal. Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, I remember he used to send us boxes. Um, you know, I guess, like, a swap for our knowledge. Like, what's going on? What are people messing with yeah. in the New York City? What are girls like? Are they like Blazers or they like the MX 95s? Really for the information, because I feel like, you know, unless, like, I remember Tinker's telling me one time that he used to go travel to West Fort to the mm-hmm. cage mm-hmm. or just to look and get, you know, insight. And, and, and But most people don't do that. Mm. So it's like, how tough is it to know what's going on out in the world if you're stuck in Portland? Yeah, that's why they hired people like us. Mm. We brought the inside in-house. Because, mm. you know, Tinker, as he grew, he couldn't do that. He couldn't go to West Fourth. He couldn't go to the west side of Chicago anymore. He couldn't go, you know, to Philly. He couldn't go to sure. L.A. on the beach. You know, he just couldn't. So they started to hire younger folks like us. And they, um, you know, they turned how we think. Because the, the thing about, like you said, they send you a box to ask for insight. But they don't. Just back in the day. Back in the day, right? Still the same, almost same thing. It's more of a shout out now, though. Yeah, it's more of like, hey, let's see. It kind of makes it relevant. But 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 they don't understand the intentions behind why things happen. That was the hard part. Is to just to just to share kind of like innate sense of what's cool and what's not cool that you have when you grow up in certain environments. And so they tried to study it and then turn it into a process. And then once it became a process, the people who really understood the authenticity of it, and this just ain't, isn't Nike, this is, I'm talking about the industry in across general. Across the board, yeah. Across the board. They were like, oh, we don't need you. We're, you're good now. We, you told us how to be cool and how to speak your language and how to look like you. So right. now we'll copy and paste it. Right. But now they're realizing that culture moves, man. It's organic. It doesn't stay fixed. And now they're playing catch up. A lot of these companies are playing catch up with collaborations because they know like, oh, snap, like we need to remain authentic. That's uh, that's the that's the main thing that they're realizing that that what they what they got for that time was good, mm-hmm. but it doesn't stay. It's not static. Yeah, but that's okay. big business though. That's corporate American, and it's no knock to any shoe company. It's mm-hmm. what happens when you become big. You mm-hmm. can't get the truth anymore. People are afraid to tell you when something is whack because they don't want to burn the bridge. Like, sure, oh, sure. Man, I still want to get you know connected. So, uh, you know, my hope and prayer is that instead of trying to bring people to to Oregon or to Nuremberg and stuff like that. Do what Brooklyn uh, Adidas is doing at Brooklyn Farm. Sure, like, sure. Put it in the community. Sure. Provide jobs. Like find look, people. Find people. Don't just take from them, but give them back something. You know, mm-hmm. let them let them be self sufficient. Let them have the pride of saying, "I work for this company." And then walk around their neighborhood and show people. That, that's for real because I swear, all I see from Adidas is kids wearing shell toes. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have this talk because we're we're sneaker guys, yeah, and we're kind of tuned in in a different way. But when I see these high school kids, I'm just seeing shell toes. These kids are not rocking Ultra Boost like that. You go to sneaker con, you'll see some kids, you know, because they can use dad's credit card. Yeah. Have some Yeezys, but I'm talking about that kid on Fulton Street. Sure. That kid on Pickin Avenue. Sure. He wants Adidas, but 
But the only thing he has access to is shell toe. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Even to see the Adidas track pants come back like they are, yeah. like, you know, this is something that like they really had a resurgence. You know, yeah. how, you know, we touched on it before, but how real is that uh, uh, sneaker beef? And what I mean by that is like, say when you worked in Jordan Brand yeah. and someone found out that you went to Adidas party, you know, I don't know, one of your friends, uh, you know, yeah. is, is that real? Like, you know, oh, when I was there, it was super real. It was really like you would get fired over that stuff. Like even you couldn't even <laughs> you couldn't even say the word fashion. We call it the F word. <laughs> like if it, you said fashion, like fashion, like bro, we a sports company. What are you talking about fashion? Like you know the reason why I say that yeah. for. I remember like Adidas uh, flew me out to uh, L A a couple of years ago when they were putting out like the crazy boost. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, there's a couple of friends I had like that worked in PR companies for Jordan Brand, and they're like, "Oh shit, premium pizza in town." And I was like, "Yeah, pull up." And like, man, I don't know the Jordan Brand guys today. I'm like, "Oh, this ain't no fucking gang. You ain't no crip and yeah, blood. Yeah, like, pull gonna, the fuck up, yeah, man." We're gonna roll out and start like hitting you with the lace toggle from the five like hey fam like, <laughs> put patent leather on your mouth shut up nah it's i mean it, it became because you, you remember we were a sports company sports is competition sure so it was embedded in everybody that worked there either you love sports or you were an athlete it was a time where nike nike's lunch pickup game d1 nba players mm. like the pickup game what could have been an actual nba game because mm. everybody at that company had ties to sports now it's changed, you know, because sports is, is, is relevant, but not as much as it was back then. Um, and it's diversified in fashion and style has taken over. But, yeah, man, it's it's interesting because the sneaker beef now is about market share. Sure. You know, they mm-hmm. just want to make sure they can compete for the dollars of the kid. But what I'm asking them to do is why don't y'all compete with providing jobs? Mm-hmm. Why don't y'all compete with, with amplifying the power of education and access? Why don't y'all compete with killing some of the negativity you see in the industry instead of competing to get us to be consumers? Why don't you compete to see who can make the most creators and entrepreneurs? That, to me, is more compelling. Sure. Was, was that your mindset? Was that your, your attitude when you found yourself leaving Nike and then, and then entering Silicon Valley? Did 100%. you still kind of have that, that competitive spirit, but also that desire? 100%. To see, to see yeah. because it's, we constantly complain about how Silicon Valley is not diverse at all. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, you know, it's, it's, I actually would challenge that. Like, Silicon Valley is diverse when you think about the people who are first-generation immigrants. Mm-hmm. Because to disrespect the people who come to this country and go there and make billions, like, then we overlook. When we talk about diversity, I know we're saying women and people of color who are already here. Mm -hmm. Um, And that is real. Like, you go, I mean, less than 1% of people who get funded are people of color, Mm -hmm. right? Like, less than 1%. So 99 deals happen, one of them is a person of color that gets Mm -hmm. the deal, Mm -hmm. which is crazy because considering that, you know, I call it melanated culture because if you know the size of how many people on the planet are, are considered people of color, we're not minorities mathematically. It's impossible. I don't even think we're minorities in it's the It's crazy that it's even a word, it's a, a minority, word. minority. When, it, when you're the majority. Man, yeah. listen, all of, all of us are melanated people. That's mm. the thing. You may have different amounts of melanin, but it's something that connects us all because I don't believe in the construct of race. That's a lie. That was all invented. Um, even the phrases that we use today to segment Caucasoid, you know, um, I can go down the list, but it's, they're all, they all were used to, to separate and control. But when talking back, back, back to the Silicon Valley, what's so fascinating is when I got there, I had to ask myself, instead of worrying about what they can do, I had to say, what can I do? What mm. brings unique value? What helps me stand out? The first thing was like, all right, I'm the guy that worked at Nike. All the VCs now want to say they're sneakerheads, and they're not. They have a lot of them. Actually, shout out to Ryan Sweeney. That brother's a real collector. He's really about the culture. Mm-hmm. That's the guy who brought me to work at um, a venture capital firm called Excel, who taught me how to raise money, how to you know, think about the deal flow, and how to construct my story. So you went out to Silicon Valley, not to start super heroic, your, your, no, the, the kids but to learn. Brand. To, to learn. To learn. Yeah. So you took your family out to yeah. Silicon Valley? Took everybody. After grad school, went back to Nike, then quit after my son had gotten sick, and I decided to use my gifts and talents to figure out the way to attack this emerging problem of childhood obesity and, and medicated youth because we keep putting our kids on medicine to help them with behavior modification. Like, oh, I'm, I'm down. Okay, give them, uh, give them, you know, Percocet or, you know, they can't focus. Give them Ritalin. Like, yeah. you know, it's it's wild. Instead of take your butt outside and play. Mm-hmm. You bored? Go outside. You know, um... So I knew that my background wouldn't, it wouldn't give me the opportunity to raise capital. It would give me the opportunity to meet people because they wanted to, you know, connect with the Jordan guy. But I also knew I had to develop new muscles to take on new challenges. Like I told you earlier, eliminate the way people can tell me no. So I spent the first couple of years lecturing and teaching through through a fellowship at Stanford um, and then also working in a hardware company, a startup, you know, where I was, I wasn't a a founder, but I saw how, what it meant to raise capital and, and build out hardware and build engineering teams. Jumped into a software company where I was a co-founder uh, along with Steph Curry and another Nike, former Nike employee, Bryant Barr. 
um, and really saw what it took to raise capital as a founder and what it looked like to write the business plan. So it took five years for me to get to this point to build Super Up because I had to first study the craft of Silicon Valley and understand how do I show up, how do I participate, what's my style of play. Um, and once I got all those pieces and I felt I was ready, I went out and I put my plan together and raised the first million and a half in like 90 days. Mm. How, wow. how did you even think of super heroic? Like, is that is that something you came up with? And- yeah, yeah. It, it took. Uh, so, the how, how my process works is I, I try to I take a phrase to begin with, and um, the phrase was you know comes from one of my favorite scriptures. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And there's this notion of I could do all things. I could do all things. I could, and I kept repeating it to myself out loud. I would go to the gym. I would say all things, all things. What does that mean? Who could do all things? And then after going through that cadence of trying to simplify it, I was like, superheroes, superheroes can do anything. Okay, then what is it about a superhero that could be relevant? So I started to research the history of superheroes. Frederick Nietzsche was the first, one of the first people to talk about this concept of a superhero and, you know, call it Ubermensch. He was the guy who inspired Superman and this notion of we have these innate powers that, that we don't tap into because we, we're told we're not powerful. Um, and start understanding, you know, the hero's journey, which is a great book that breaks down our need for heroes ancestrally and in, in present tense. And then I realized that it's one of the most ubiquitous concepts ever that has never been used to create a company mm. like ever. Why, why, a, why a children's brand? Like why a children's shoe or, cho- or a children's footwear? Why create that? Like what, what yeah. made you want to do that? Because nobody is actually trying to innovate for them. Mm-hmm. Nobody's trying to build them up. Everybody's trying to tell them they're too small to do anything. So I'm like, well, if, if, my selfish desire with this company is very simple. I look at what happened, you know, um, in Nazi Germany and how they eradicated Nazism through education. They didn't try to fix the broken adults. They focused on teaching the children that it was very wrong. Here's the history. Here's the impact of why that shouldn't happen again. So I'm looking at the world today and I'm thinking, do I spend my time trying to make products to help people get their blood pressure down, get better sleep, feel good about themselves and adult fix broken adults? Or do I just focus on prevention, build stronger children? Do I go to the beginning and say, can we prevent any of this from happening? Because the beautiful thing about play is it doesn't matter what you look like. If we had if we went right now to the playground, we drop a ball on the ground. We only have to speak the same language. We both know that there are some rules involved with this thing. We're going to figure out how to play together. So internally at our company, we say if you can play together, you can live together. And our hope is that if we keep institutionalizing that mindset and we give kids this ability to continuously play with one another, and see each other as as friends and as as people that are worthy of each other's respect and attention. Um, then when they become adults, these would be the same people that are writing policies. These would be the same people leading sure. companies, same sure. people running for office. And they'll keep that mindset of togetherness through play. You know, it's amazing to me. You were able to um, start a brand, start a vision, and then get people like Magic Johnson to invest. Mm-hmm. People like the founder of eBay. Mm-hmm. Um, Pierre fa- uh, found One of the founders of Android. Andy Rubin. But, yes. oh, okay, first of all, you. This, when, when I talk about you, you it's cliche, but your, your network is your network. Yes. You were really living that fucking life. How, does, how, how did that even happen? Like, How do you get guys like that to believe in you? Um, one, uh, believing in yourself. Like, you know, nobody... They expect you to, if you're in the room or you're lucky enough to be around them, they expect for you to have some gifts and talents, right? They expect for you to go and, and push yourself and try things that are difficult. What they don't expect is for you to offer up those gifts and talents without expecting anything in return. Mm-hmm. So I went and spoke from everywhere from, you know, juvenile detention centers to hospitals to rehab centers to universities to churches. I just would give of myself and tell my story to as many people as possible and just be a servant. I would design logos for kids who wanted to start their own companies. I would design logos for companies that were massive. I didn't for have free? for free or a significantly reduced cost. I mean, here I am with 15 years of experience, multiple degrees, well-known background, and I'm charging, you know, 500 bucks to just do logos. Cause it wasn't about the price. It was about the fact that this person had a network. This person, you know, had unlimited amounts of capital. So there was nothing I can give them. I can, I can buy their friendship, but what I can say is here's my gifts and talents in service of something bigger than me. And after a while, people saw that I was a genuine person because when you network with those types of people, they think you want something from them. They True. don't expect they, you they to offer. They have motive. Yeah. And so they saw me living exactly what I would say I was doing. They, they, every time they heard about me, it was I'm coming from or going to mentoring some, some youth or working with kids or working. In, and it's not a tactic. It's really who I am. Like we talk about Joel Rodriguez. Like I was in Coopie Hewitt on Halloween talking to kids who were kind of on the fence about their life because that was me. I was halfway in the streets, True. halfway in the classroom. True. Likewise. Right. And so it 
I continuously find myself in a place of service. And it's so funny because the more you give, the more you receive. Like I give on myself freely. I answer every text, every DM, every person that reaches out to me. I try my best to get back to them because that can be the difference between that person taking a life or taking a risk and investing in themselves. And I've been in that moment where you reach out to a person when you're desperate and no one responds back. And you feel like, well, if no one's responding, maybe I don't mean anything. Maybe I should just kill myself. Like you see dark places people go to. So going into the Silicon Valley, which is a very performative culture, everybody's competitive. This person that shows up as a servant, you automatically stand out like a sore thumb. Like you don't want nothing from me. You're mm-hmm. servant. What's wrong with you? And these people who have that amount of money, when they see that, they're like, not only is this person different, but this person is grinding. They're going to go hard. When things get tough, they're going to figure it out. So the things that we call, talk about in the inner city, you know, struggling, that's an entrepreneurship mindset, learning how to do a lot with a little. Like I purposefully raised a small amount. It wasn't that we couldn't get more. We had people. When you say small amount, how much did you raise? Our first round was 1.5. Before that, I invested my own money, live off credit cards, my whole life savings. Then we raised 1.5 million. And then the second round, we raised 5 million. So a total of roughly seven so far. You know, we had people who were offering to, you know, quadruple that with a check. But do you have an insight, like when you deal with like the founder of eBay, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. do you, do you have a, a, a mindset of what you would like him to, you know, get involved with? Yeah, absolutely. You have to think about it strategically. Like here's our business, here's certain verticals, here's certain gaps. Does this person have an expertise in the network that can help us be proficient in that area? Sure. Um, so with Pierre Midyar and his network of people, Pierre loves the gaming culture, plays Overwatch, is really deeply embedded into, into you know, massive online gaming. So is my son, so is every other kid. Because that whole notion we talked about earlier, boom, 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 can he come outside and play? That's happening now with a message on PS4 or yeah, yeah. on PC. <laughs> could, you wanna, you, could you come online and can play? you come online and play? It's happening still, just in a different way. Sure. So knowing that Pierre is deeply embedded into that culture, first as a fan and a gamer, and then as a founder, I'm like, okay, who else can I talk to about these passions that I have that would get it? Like he, Because the thing people don't understand about eBay, it was not a marketplace. It was a community. Mm. It was a true, it was one of the first true social communities. You, you were giving people explicit trust when you signed up to buy something from them. You don't know that person. So the power of that star rating was like, oh man, the community say this person's a five. Absolutely. I need, Absolutely. I trust that person. You know, you, you gave them your money and you waited and you trusted that, you know, something would, would come to your door. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So I knew we wanted to build that with our company because in order to launch a new brand today, we have to have trust be part of our business model. How can you trust a company that, that you don't know that came out of nowhere? So, you know, he specifically, you know, um, what about, us with that. what about magic Johnson? Magic. How is, did you, how did you even get him involved? Um, I was lecturing and, and serving in the community. Um, so I had started the, I was advising Steph Curry's company at first and magic had came to the Silicon Valley for some meetings. He was actually giving a lecture at Stanford and, um, I had brought Brian and Steph together and said, Hey, magic's in the room. And Ryan Smith, who's, who's led the investment. Shout out to Ryan was like, yo man, um, it'd be great for you to be in a room as an advisor to kind of tell a story. So Magic and I kind of struck up a relationship. And then two months later, I was receiving a, 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 a service award in Chicago for this project called One Goal, where they help get kids um, from Latino and African-American community into college for the first time. And I do a lot of mentorship and speaking. And I'm actually headed back to the show after this um, to go and speak at the same event. And here it is, Magic's in the audience again. And he's like, I just saw this dude. Now he's on stage pouring his heart out into the kids like, who, why, who, where'd you come from? Why did Magic why? had to connect to you because he saw, he saw that you had clones, like he has clones. Yeah. I'm, I'm watching Magic, um, at an LA game, you know, on my phone, and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm at this theater on 125th Street, Magic Johnson Theater, and Magic is there watching a movie too. Yeah. How is Magic in LA and New York at the same time? Yeah. Magic has clones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's yeah. everywhere. Everywhere, man. So, I, so somebody like Magic invest into super heroic uh, without wanting to, you know, too much rules involved. Like, is there some like people yeah. who say like, well, we're going to put some money in, you keep us updated? Oh yeah, yeah. We give quarterly, you know, board updates. We I try to give quarterly board updates um, or investor updates. Um, I try to you know, work with them as closely as possible. Have them, I call them investment partners. Sure. I don't call them investors. I sure. feel like they're partners in our business. Magic in particular brings a different level of connection to the inner city because he builds businesses that are based on sensibility of people from the city environment, like Starbucks playing soul music. That wasn't sure. a thing until sure. Magic put Starbucks in, in Inglewood. Mm-hmm. Is, uh, is Magic the biggest investor uh, in this? No, biggest investor is Andy Rubin, the founder yeah. of Android Playground, his, uh, his investment firm. Wow. 
Yeah, so they put in the largest check, and they give us a tremendous amount of resources. And I love Andy and his and his team because here they are, this small group of people. They create a company called Danger, produces a sidekick at a time where BlackBerry was crushing everybody. So they disrupted that whole kind of like, you know, handheld device, you know, communication device. Everybody thought Motorola and, and BlackBerry, that was it. You couldn't topple them. Then he comes out with an operating system, Android. Everybody said, oh, iOS just is king. And then boom, there it is. He Android surpasses iOS. So this man disrupted mul- the same industry multiple times. So I needed to learn how he did that because I'm trying to disrupt the footwear industry sure. at a time when people say that you can't. Sure. So who better to learn from than a person that disrupted the mobile industry? Well, I think you have a, a perfect chance to do that in, in, in children's footwear. Yep. You know, um, I think that uh, there's a home for children's footwear. How much does it take to start a, a company like, you know, Super Heroic? Um, You know, since we have experience... A lot of it we do we did ourselves in the beginning, so we didn't have to rely on resources. So the capital expenditure to get the product out the door, to get the marketing done, first event, pay my first employee. Because I didn't take a salary up until four months ago, and we started the company a year and a half ago, um, was less than a million. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, some people would raise 30 and still never ship a product. So I saw that enough where, you know, people raise all this cash, product never comes out. I was like, nah, I want to do a lot with a little in a shorter amount of time. I want to raise a small amount of money, have a small team, and then push a product out into the world in half the time that people think you can. What do you expect from um, something like Super Heroic? Like, what, what's your goal? My goal, Besides honest, to get them on people's feet. Uh, well, you know, the, one, we're not a shoe company. I want to point that out. Okay. We use shoes as a mechanism to encourage kids to play, but we're an experience company, an entertainment company. We have a lot of stuff coming in the pipeline that, that you'll start to see where we're headed with that piece. What I hope to see, man, honestly, selfishly, I want to see every kid on the planet, man, like have the confidence that I have coming out of the neighborhoods I come from. Um, having kids see themselves as, you know, as as capable and possible and have a sense of self-efficacy, you know, have their own identity instead of being told who they should be. Um, I want to be a big enough company to provide jobs. I want to be able to create, you know, a system where, you know, people who... Like, I think about it like this. When I was at Nike, most people don't know this story. I've actually never told it publicly. But I was uh, I was homeless for, like, the first four months working at Nike. I didn't have credit. I didn't even know what credit was. I couldn't get an apartment. You know, without credit, you can't get an apartment. I was sleeping under my desk at Nike um, and taking showers at the gym and, like, pretending. Like, people would come in like, oh, how, why'd you get here so early? Oh, man, you know, I want to, you know, grind. But I was living at the company. Um, the janitors at the, at, the, at the company held me down a lot like they they would bring me food they would talk to me they would encourage me it was it was amazing like these people that no one actually see this invisible force that just makes everything neat and tidy at night were the people who were like my caretakers so one of my greatest aspirations in this company is i want to i want to change the paradigm on these roles that people often overlook and make them important so instead of them you know when we have our own campus lord willing i want to call instead of the janitors or custodial services i want to call them night watchmen because they're protecting your ip they're like the people who protect the the essence of the company at night so i, I want to change every single facet of these underappreciated roles from the person serving the food to the security guard to the janitor to whomever and if we could do that and make everybody in the company feel valuable generate wealth for every person that works for us like the Chibani founder he's my actual entrepreneurship hero like what that dude did coming to this country sure. with a yoga company and, and making everybody that works for him wealthy sure. that's what I want to do you know I'll tell you one thing man you know you, you uh, know, that Greek, hold on. Yo- that Greek yogurt single handedly changed the game got Greece out of debt <laughs> <laughs> well first of all first of all yo thank you for putting some laughter into this because I do want to say something man um that story you just told is uh, very touching. And what I mean by that is so often people see the shine. They see the watches. They see the shoes. They see the cars. They never see the kid sleeping in the desk, the stories that are not fun to hear from. Let me tell you something, man. One thing I, I admire about you, and, and I want to let you know this is super inspiring, and I know anybody listening, man, I'm excited for you to hear this. But that story you just told, man, anything that fucking comes your way, you deserve. Because you put it all on the line and you never gave up, man. You could People could have gave up, man, so easily, man. Like And, 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 and you know, now it's cool to, to, to tell a story like that, but you live that story. Yeah. You know, um, have you had any chances to celebrate somebody's success? Nah, that's what I'm terrible at. Yeah. 
I don't like like Jordan Brand uh, uh, reached a billion. You know, you you made a certain amount of money. Nah. Um, you design your own shoe. No, nah, I take some look, look. Take some fucking time to celebrate some successes. Doesn't mean that uh, it, you know you, you're getting lazy or, or or stopping or slowing down. You don't know if tomorrow's promise, man. Yeah, no, that's real, and that's what I'm trying to practice more of is self care, slowing down and appreciating it. Super heroic, superheroic dot com. Yes, sir. What the is, right now? It's what they're offering in super heroic is children's shoes. Yeah, right? footwear. Well, we call it the utility kit. So it's footwear, capes, all that stuff. What size is it? They start with start with twelve C, which is the little ones, yep, the yep, young yep. ones, all the way up to seven Y. So mm -hmm. that's oh, that's a big size. Yeah, roughly. You know, it could be a young, small adult, or you know, a bigger child. And they could order it on superheroic dot com. Yes, why sir. not Foot Locker? Or why not like you know? Um. Well, a lot of it is is I don't want to. I don't want to play the wholesale so wholesale game. But you say you're not, and you're not a shoe company. Not a shoe company, and you know. You, yeah, but for that, but for that, for that time uh, being, when you do make a show, you, shoe, you could, you know, work with them to well, get released. Well, you lose control of your brand. Mm -hmm. You lose control of the intent. And now, mm -hmm. I'm, now I'm sitting here answering the people who don't really care because they're trying to make sure that their margin and their reports to Wall Street are on point. I don't want to play that game. I really do want this company to be about the youth, about the kids, not about. My, my, my earnings to Wall Street, like, yes, do we want to make a lot of money? Absolutely. I'm not in this for charity, but at the same time, I don't want it to be controlled by people who are just looking at numbers. Mm. Cause you gotta... If anything, Super Heroic should be sold inside Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah. <laughs> Shout to Chuck, Chuck e. Cheese. Does Chuck E. Cheese have a gift shop? <laughs> no, no, but they, and they got I don't have kids, so I've never been into Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah, Just yeah. don't eat the pizza. The pizza that, it would be creepy yeah, for yeah, me to go terrible. to Chuck E. Cheese. But we do have a van called the Hero Lab. It's on tour on the West Coast. It okay. basically brings little superhero training modules to playgrounds and parks, and kids can go out Fuck. And, and show what they Listen, can do. Listen, I got a two year old, uh, I got an older daughter yeah. who's driving me fucking crazy about yeah. to go to college. Yeah. And then I got a two and a half year old. Yeah. I got to get involved in some of these things for him because yeah, I'll be on. honest with you, being a single dad. Um, for my daughter, yeah. Um, I always tell people it was one of the hardest things I ever did. Yeah. I'll never forget the the, the first weekend. Um, St you're still a single dad. Well, you know, I didn't get married yet to my to, to, to my uh, beautiful lady. But stop fucking getting me in trouble. Your in this roommate. Shit. Um, you know, he, here's, a, here's a guy who was boyfriend and girlfriend for so many years. You know, you gotta hate motherfuckers like this. <laughs> Common law marriage. They, they, they were dating for like twelve years. They just got married three years ago, and now they want to piss on everybody. Like, you know what I mean? But like y'all filing tax reports together. It, it, you ain't it, married. It, exactly. <laughs> but no, you know what I want to say. And 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 this is my my. You know, I, throughout my troubles, I always try to. You know, help fellow parents. I always yeah. preach presence over presence. Amen. Being in your kid's life. You know, yep. anyone who knows me will tell you that. Uh, more importantly, I'll never forget. I always tell this story. Um, me and her, me and me, me and my ex-wife got divorced. I would say about you know my daughter was about three when I really started to get into the motion. My daughter was about five years old. I'll never forget the first time I picked her up. Uh, it was a Friday, uh, a, a Saturday morning, and I, I I was a regular parent until then. I'm like, what do I, what do I do? Where do I go? Yeah, I, I didn't know what to do with my kid. You know, it was so easy just being a dad in the house. Yep. You know what I mean? And and no shots to people who live with their kids. And sometimes it's easy. You know, you'll see your kid tomorrow. Yep. When you're a single, separated dad like that, you have a limited time. I'll never forget. And I tell the story all the time, and I'm just gonna tell it again for those people who haven't heard. My 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 sister had a kid a couple years older, and I called her up and I said, Hey, what's going on? She's like, Oh, nothing. I'm going to the zoo. Zoo? Can I come? Like I, I, and she was like, "Yeah, yeah, if you want." And I was like, "Yeah, I needed yeah. the the guidance, and I needed the activities. You know, after school was everything to me. Yeah, you know, uh, being able to do things with with other fellow parents and stuff like that. Absolutely, it's important. I, you know, it's hard for a dad. Sometimes I remember, you know, people used to say like, you know, I used to just tell like, you know, people like, "Hey, I'm just a dad. I'm learning." Yeah. And yeah. I think it's important to do activities like that. One hundred percent, because it builds, man. It builds this beautiful set of memories, man. Because your kids see you as a hero at that age, mm. and they think that you could do anything. And that's what we see from our events. Like, case in point, our launch event was on July 15th. We call our events, the, like, leagues of play. So when kids say, I'm going to the league, they go into our league of play. Um, we saw a dad who clearly was, you know, a migrant worker with his son. And he was standing there watching the event go down, and he's wondering, can he participate? And my wife is Colombian, and, you know, shout out to my wife. I love you very much. 
Oh, so, Bandeja Paisa. Hey, Medellin, man. She's Paisero. Okay. Uh, what the fuck is going on here? Are you, are you trying to... Uh, I, I know I'm a vegetarian, but he, he, when he said Colombian, I, got, I just got hype. Bandeja Paisa. I got hype for the country plate. You know what that is, right? Bandeja Paisa. It's like, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's New York. Y'all yeah, of know. course, man. Yeah, if I say it. You don't know shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, Go ahead, uh, where were but, you? But, so we're watching this gentleman, right? And he's sitting on the bench, and his son is like, man, you know, man, we, can we go play? I'm sure it costs a lot of money, and our events are free. So then we tell the kid, the guy to come over, like, come on over, man. Like, yo, bring your, bring your son, come through. And then we saw this moment happen where he went from station to station. He was getting free stuff, food, being able to play every game. You know, there was no, you know, no exchange of money. He started looking at his dad like he was the man, like he had the plug. Because everywhere his dad went, he got something. And this boy just came to life. And you saw everybody there that was paying attention to it. Because you got to have eyes to see this stuff. Sometimes you tuned out. Everybody has eyes, but not everybody can see. And we're watching and we see this moment happen where the son looks at his dad with so much reverence. And the father kind of pokes his chest out like, for that moment, he wasn't overlooked. He was the biggest man on the planet. And his little boy has so much pride and love. And right next to him, right next to him is a person, I won't say their name, who's a billionaire playing with his child. And then their children start playing. And then the billionaire starts talking to the migrant worker. And then they're shaking hands. They're hugging. Both fathers crying, taking pictures of their kids. And I'm sitting there thinking like, play facilitated that no one knew what each other did they didn't know each other's backgrounds like we knew because i knew the gentleman over here and i was watching that gentleman over there but in that moment they were just dads trying to figure it out they were just dads that was still learning and their kids were just kids having fun on the playground mm, damn mm. so that's what we want to keep damn man man, I, man good thing these microphones are on stand shit exactly because these you need to take yours off and just throw it on the floor <laughs> hey, don't do that yet listen <laughs> jason maiden's here dropping gems Really just, um, you know, it, it's amazing. You found you found your lane, man. You it's really my had, purpose. You found your purpose, more importantly. Uh, what's your most memorable moment, if you could say? You still got a lot more, but what's your most memorable moment? Oh, man. Um, most memorable moment? Honestly, um, first date with my wife. Mm. It was cool, man, because she, she rejected me. I'm used to rejection. Um, but she told me no because she's a very respectable woman, faith-based, has a high self-esteem and, and cares about herself deeply. And I told her, I said, no means, no, it's all good. We can just be friends. Don't want anything. I'm not a pushy dude. I wasn't raised to be thirsty. So all that, yo, let me, that's not my style. Come here, Ma. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't do that. It's took, like, took the curve, took the curve like a champ. Yeah, it's like, okay, cool. No means, no, I know my, I know my worth. That's your loss, not mine. So I just mm -hmm. kind of kept it moving. But then we became friends. And, and on the first day, we just had these conversations about life and about legacy and about just who we wanted to be in the world. And mm -hmm. I thought it was so cool that she didn't laugh in my dreams. Like, I told her, yo, my 20s, I'm going to go through three passports. Because to me, I'll take a lower salary, but I need to travel. How many are you on now? I'm on five. God fucking damn it, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's. I mean. Antoinette, man. Pay attention. Yeah, because, you, you know, everybody's like, I want the big check. I'm like, nah, man. I, I grew up in Chicago. I never saw anything. I want to travel. Like, if Nike pay for me to travel the world, that's the, that's education. That's free. They can't take that from me. Mm. The money can go away. The experience, they, man. They can't the take journey. that from me. Yeah. How important is the journey, man? It's 100%. Everything. Everything. The journey is everything. Cause pe pe people people are so focused on the destination, they forget about the journey. The journey is everything. Everything, dude. It's it's When you, we can't control the outcome of a situation, but we can control the inputs. We can control our effort, our energy, how we respond to stuff, our emotions, our, you know, our, our, our sense of self-worth. So that journey, man, you know, of traveling the world for 10 years to reach my goal of three passports, she didn't laugh. And then when I told her, you know, you know, over the years, I'm going to start this company. She didn't laugh. Or I'm going to run for mayor of Chicago. She didn't laugh. Like, she always says, okay, I, I I expect you to. So having a person that don't laugh at your crazy dreams, that's, that's a beautiful thing, man. Listen, there's a bunch of new amazing designers and creatives doing stuff with sneakers. Yeah. Anybody, uh, you know, that you see up and coming that you that you got your eye on or that you really uh, are seeing doing some good shit out here? Yeah, you know, I like... Um, I like the young fella, Salehi, who okay. went over to Versace, yep. really good kid, you know, figuring out his way. He still has a lot to learn, you know, in the corporate structure, but I think he's he's very promising. Really good brother. Um, my young boy, my family, you know, blood for my own blood, Ben Kirshner. Mm -hmm. um, ben is doing great things. Really like what Ben is doing um, and what he's trying to do. I wish there were more young women who were in the footwear game designing. Um, unfortunately, it's not as many, but the, the young women who are still out there, not at the major companies, but still making waves. Cherise Thornhill, she's now teaching. Um, she was a world-class designer at Nike, left after a few years. Um, Ashley Payne, 
um, at Nike. She's crazy talented. Lynn Kwan is crazy talented. Um, man, it's so many young up and coming, you know, footwear designers. But I think the interesting thing is when they don't use the word footwear and they just use the word design. Designers, yeah. Um, you know, you think about designers and you think about creatives. We're in a world where it's, you know, bigger than ever. Everybody wants to be one. Yeah. What's some advice you would give to somebody listening to this who wants to be a designer, wants to be an entrepreneur, wants to be in your world, or more importantly, even someone who's doing it, but, you know, not so, really. Someone who wants to create. Yeah. yeah. I mean, don't worry about, don't worry about judgment, you know, do what you think, what you feel is right to you. Because there's an audience for that. There's someone that's going to think what you make is beautiful. It might not be everybody. Be open to criticism. Don't get easily offended. Don't wear your heart on the sleeve. Because when you put something into the world, it's going to be judged. That's the world we live in. Everybody's going to have an opinion on what you do. Separate your self-worth from your from your work. You know, your work is an extension of who you are, but it shouldn't be who you are. Because mm. if, if I was to base how I felt about myself off of all the footwear I worked on, Man, the comment section would have had me hurt myself years ago, you know. Um, so I just tell people don't don't get offended so easily, you know, because hurting they people. They run you through people. the mill. They run you through the mill. They run everybody through the mill. What, what are you on social at Jason Maiden? At Jason Maiden, yeah, M A Y D E N. Yep. Twitter, same Instagram. thing. Instagram, yeah, mm-hmm. everything is simple. I mean, you know, because the reality of it all in the creative arts, man, you get better the older you get. It's like golf, like wine. Yeah, man, you you slow down. You learn that art, like true design, is editing. Mm. It's really about how you edit something. Mm. What you take away from it makes it beautiful. When you start out, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, like you're like Jackson Pollock. You're throwing paint everywhere. You're just mm. throwing stuff, seeing what works. But you get older and it's like, wait, hold on. It's sculpture. Let me take this off. Take that off. Okay, simplify it. That's it. That's beautiful. That's finished. It's finishing, you know. Um, when you're young, you just start a design. Mm. But mm. you get older, you learn how to finish one. How do you stop the noise, man? You got noise in your head, man? I got noise in my head. All the time. How do you stop it? Prayer. Prayer, man. Prayer. I'm. I, look, I tell people nothing happens by me. Everything happens through me. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not me doing it. I pray about it. I let it go. My whole mantra is do less. God is more. Like, I tell myself that daily, just Jason, do less. I only can control my emotions. That's it. That's mm-hmm. the only thing I know I'm in control of is how I show up in the world. So the noise in my head when I start to feel overwhelmed because I never really sleep. Um, I talk out loud to myself to work through things. But I find a dark room. I center myself. And I just basically talk to myself, say, Jason, just do less, do less, just do less. It's okay. Do less. You're not the savior. You're not responsible for saving the world. You need to focus on improving yourself, centering yourself, but just do less. So introspection, man. That's why I talk about the book Emperor's Handbook so much. You know, Marcus Aurelius. That's a great, that's a great uh, uh, segue as we wind this episode down. What are some of the books you're reading? Yeah, man. Emperor's Handbook is my all-time go-to. Marcus Aurelius, if you don't know who he is, he's the fifth of the last great five emperors of Rome. This man was basically being attacked by his own people, but still found a way to look at every relationship as important and see what he would learn from each relationship to help people that wanted to hurt him. Um, always try to read my word daily. Um, right now, um, I finished a book called how children succeed, which is an amazing book. Um, I'm in the process of reading a book again called the goal, which is a business book. And then I'm having another book that I'm gonna start called, um, uh, now is the time by Tony Evans, mm. uh, talking about just how to become the man that you hope to be, but you've been, you've been the reason why you haven't gotten there. Cause I mean, I'm by no means perfect. And I know that. And so in order for me to get to a place where I can, help other people, I first have to examine myself and look at what's broken with me. Mm. What's what's a rule in Jordan Brand uh, when you were working there that, that people may not know on the outside that's pretty kind of funny? Uh, a funny Jordan Brand rule? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, don't don't come to work in, in Adidas. Adidas. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was obvious. <laughs> no, I don't uh, mean that. Uh, hmm. You know, it's kind of an unspoken. It, don't be a fan of MJ mm-hmm. when, you, when you're working mm-hmm. with him. He's a teammate. And... That was told to me by Gentry Humphrey because MJ can smell blood in the water. He's like, you a fan? Oh, I'm about to clown you. You know, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the chameleon air story. Sure, <laughs> sure. Oh, don't start with that. <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate. But, you know, Mike, he, because he's like, yo, man, don't see yourself as less than me. Like, you, you have to be great at something. Mm-hmm. I'm great at this, but don't, don't put yourself underneath me. Did you ever tell Mike to get, uh, you know, stop wearing those, those carpenter jeans? The, the pants yeah, above his navel. Yeah. That's, Mike is 100% North Carolinian, man. At Grimley. Mm-hmm. At Grimley. Bro, you can't pull the country out of the man. Like yeah. he's another. Uh, that's why him and um, um, uh, Larry Miller get along because they be wearing those draft day suits, man. Yeah, the draft day nineteen. I mean, that's just his thing. MJ, MJ is is MJ is uh, MJ is like 
Lavert. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, just yeah. This, he's classic R and B. He's I'm gonna tuck in this mock neck, wear this hoop in ring, drink some cognac. Red, <laughs> red, red, red eyes. All, all uh, that's um, it. All uh, what do they call that when you got put visine and you got like uh, I mean, the bloodshot, and bloodshot eyes. Yeah, yeah Yo, Lavert. What was Jordan's uh, uh, Jordan Brand's like the, the the team's reaction when Fight Club opened? Um, you know, I it, it didn't really react. I mean, just to, what was their thoughts? I no, I just wonder by that because you know, yeah. think about it, Fight Club, you know. It kind of changed a lot of the game. Yeah, it kind of, it kind of gave a, yeah. a, a price gauge. It kind of yeah. became the stock market yeah. for kicks. Yeah. Did, did you see that as a help? For- it, it, it was. I mean, I think it, it um, well, one, you know, I think it over indexed the value of the retros over the new product. So I think that's the thing. Like, we opened up Pandora's box because mm-hmm. that was really a strategy because we didn't have enough people to create enough new stuff. And a lot of us, hey, we need to bring back certain styles that didn't got a little bit of love that we think can get a lot of love and keep teaching people about the history. It wasn't what it is today. It was it was really because we were, excuse me, really uh, severely understaffed and just being smart about how we use resources. So when Fight Club became almost like a stock exchange for footwear where, you know, you saw here's the demand on this product, which means that you increase the value of it. Sure. Um, it, it helped us with our pricing. It helped us with learning how to do limited editions and distribution. Um how to create the chase, you know? So I think the people who probably reacted more were the sales reps, mm. you know, because then they had to figure out new ways to, like, how do I, because I'm not getting, you know, these things anymore. How do I get my product out there? Well, how do we compete? I feel so. like Nike um, and Jordan Brand, the prices back in the day went up so slowly. Like, I remember, yeah. like, when the GSMX 97s or 95s, yeah. they, were a nine, they, were, they were 85 or 75. Then they went to, like, 80, then 85, and then up. 92. Um, and then, you know, it's crazy uh, when you really think about how much the prices are today. Yeah. Has the materials really gone up that much or just are, are prices going up? No, you got to look at macroeconomics. You got to look at the price of oil. Because a lot of the materials are petroleum based, so it's, it's based on that. So if oil price goes up, transportation cost goes up. Transportation cost goes up, most likely labor cost is going to go up. So everything everything's happening on a macroeconomic scale, and it impacts certain industries that are heavily dependent on petroleum. So plastic, rubber, you know, synthetic leather, that's all petroleum based. That's why you know you see the things like knit because it's getting off that dependency of 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 leather because leather sure. takes a lot of processing so you know so it's, it's very labor intensive to to get leather to become a shoe um so the price is correlated to how much the raw inputs cost mm. um footwear is as much as people think footwear has padded margin it really does like the air jordan i mean it's it's considered what we would call a loss leader you put it out there as your brand's greatest expression of what it could do but it's not intended to make a ton of money. It's intended to be what they call brand accretive, not margin accretive. It's not adding value to your bottom but line. But even as even as the price of retros have gone up so much, I mean, some are what like two hundred, you know, two fifty. Yeah, of course, it's where they make them. Some of the factories where they they make them are different. And, and then what about like bin? Like I remember when it came with the bin, it was almost like, look, if you want better materials, pay more fucking money. Yeah, that was. I think the bin stuff, if I recall, was like the experiment on how we start to add premium. Like materials to the retro because mm-hmm. we were using like certain leathers that would come out of Italy that we use for Ferrari and mm-hmm. high end heights that are only reserved for Lamborghini. So it was like, where do we pull from this? Why did they stop hurt? doing that? Um, I mean, a lot of it is consumers didn't pick it up. You know, mm-hmm. like it, you surprisingly, those things set. A yeah. lot of that stuff set. It didn't. It didn't. It didn't sell. So, you know, for the person who's into that, like, yo, this is the same crazy Corinth leather that's in X Y Z vehicle. This is nuts. Like. You know, most people are like, oh, it's still leather. What's the difference? Um, so you try experiments. Some of them work. Some of them don't. And that's the beauty of design is it's continuous improvement. Sure. You always get a chance to try again. Right. In training. You're, and, you're and, 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 and the market is fickle. The market mm-hmm. is funny and fickle. I know I'm super excited for this retro coming out next year in February. This Black you know, elephant. Three. Well, elephant. Same shit. Yeah. The elephant. <laughs> Same shit. Three. Three. There's an elephant yeah. in the room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> listen, About to punch you in the mouth. Listen, uh, uh, your journey is amazing. Like I said, um, you, so many fucking gems you drop. Um, I'm, I'm proud to see what comes out of Super Heroic. Like not only as a uh, footwear, but as, as as a company dropping just different type of uh, experiences Thank you, and, and, and and tangible items. Um, I really look forward, and I really just you know it's funny too because it's like sometimes uh, you know you get to kick in it with somebody who has an amazing journey, and it's like. You never know what people get from it, man. Yeah. You know, but it's real life, and 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 it's to be proud of. If you ever go back and change anything, anything you would change? No, I, nah, man. I think I think my struggle and my pain is exactly what God used to keep me humble. 
I couldn't imagine if nothing happened to me. I would be a, I would be an a-hole, bro. Like, I really would be a mean person. I think the, the difficulties I faced in my life humanize me and make me realize that, once again, it's not about me. Without that struggle, man, I couldn't create the things I create because I would think it's all me. I'm doing this. I'm the guy. I'm the man. That's not... It's not my disposition at all because I know how it feels to not have anything, to literally go, you know, without eating, to sure. not, to have to wear sure. clothes that are super small with holes in it, you know, not because it's fashion. But that's but fashion now. It's fashion, you know. <laughs> Who would have known? Homeless guy was fashion. Yeah, I know, man. It's like, you know. <laughs> what, l- l- lastly, what are some collabs that uh, uh, never made it to, uh, um, you know, I don't know if you Ooh. can talk on that, but some collabs that didn't, that you wanted to see happen while you were there that didn't Oh, happen. I'll talk about one because it's public now. The Gatorade stuff with yeah. Jordan Brand. That started in 2006. So everybody said, oh, the Gatorade. Jo-. Man, I got T-shirts at home with that with the shoes on them. We did a whole Gatorade pack. Shout out to Dave Frank and Ryan Carruthers, uh, who's in, Ryan's at IBM. They came up with the concept, two graphic designers. And Dave Frank's from New York. So, of course, he came with the coach. He's like, bro, we got all these endorsements. What if we did like a ballpark Frank's? you know, crazy, funny, like kind of tongue in cheek Jordan collaboration. What if you did a Gatorade pack? And so they were they were on that back in two thousand six, two thousand seven. Um so now to see the stuff dropping and see that Jordan is kind of hinting at the Gatorade, I think it's the fives or the sixes. Sixes, I yeah, see sixes. sixes, yeah. Yeah, like man, that that's not I as much as I yo, kudos to them for doing it, but that's like a decade ago mm-hmm. when we first did it. So that type of stuff I'm excited about. Um there was never really any brand collab. I mean, I wanted when I was there. I really wanted to do um, a collaboration with Ducati. Like, mm, I really that wanted to nice. do. Really want. I mean, we went there. I had a chance to tour Ducati. It was insane. Why didn't it happen? Just they were like, man, you know, is it really what we're doing? I mean, MJ had the racing team. You know, you did the kind of moto sure, motorsports. Yeah, but it just fell through, man. I think just not the right time. Just yeah. not the right time. Just timing. Timing is everything. Timing. Well, and, and speaking of timing, I mean, right now you are super heroic. Yep. Superheroic.com. Um, how soon do you have a timeline on when um, we can move to Chicago because you will be the mayor? Yeah. So, um, once again, remember I told you my 20s is traveling. 30s mm-hmm. is about monetizing my network. So, in my 40s, I'm running for office because I don't want to have to take campaign money. I want to be independently funded, self wealth, you know, independently wealthy. Um, so, I don't have to be caught up in that whole tin company. I want to go and do it because it's the right thing to do, not because I'm being paid to do it. Because mm-hmm. I won't take a salary, I'll give it back to the city. Mm-hmm. Stuff so another ten fifteen years. Man, this good man. Listen, there's a lot to learn here. I hope you're grabbing your um your pen and pad. If not, you know, just write it down in your notes. You know, you're in Jordan Brand. Lastly, is there a cage there with all these samples? Yeah, it What's is. What's some of the rarest shit you ever seen, man? Man, the stuff we did for MJ with Berluti, the dress shoe company. Mm. We made these Air Jordan three handmade Italian dress shoes. Mm. Anybody MJ. ever seen them? Not publicly. Mm. Yeah, we made them for Mike. Uh, gorgeous, man. Like. <laughs> Like, the elephant was actually, like, hand-engraved words. So it had, it looked like elephant print, but it was these beautiful dress shoes, like the three hand-engraved words. And uh, is That's probably the rarest because that the craftsmanship. Because, you know, I don't know if you know about Berluti, how they measure your foot, mm-hmm. they make the last and do, do all that stuff. But, I mean, gorgeous, just uh. pieces of art and stuff. And we had them in the office, and I remember just watching them walk past me, and I'm like, yo, that's a, I think it was like 50-something thousand to make them. It was crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh. But beautiful, man. God damn. We need a pair of those, man. Get the fucking Baluti, man. <laughs> <laughs> one of them. Just one just foot. One, anyway, listen, listen, listen. Uh, blessings on your journey. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll be here watching this super heroic unfold. Thank excited you, to see. And, and and more excited to see is you're not out here trying to gain uh, any social awareness for yourself. You're trying to, you know, really, really, really get the people moving, create opportunities. And, and, and man... I, I'm proud. I'm proud of you. Thank you, brother. Most definitely. Internet, listen, um, Dallas Penn, he's still staying healthy. My brother, good yes, to see sir. you as yes, always. Sir. Good to be seen. Good okay. to be seen. Diabetes Dallas. Di- 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 Diabetes Dallas. Di- uh, dialysis. dialysis Dallas. Hopefully not. Hopefully not Dialysis Dallas. Let's let's see if we can let's see if we can get this thing right. We get Ho- this thing under hopefully control. Hopefully not Cialysis Dallas. Well, Cialis oh, Dallas. Dallas. Same <laughs> shit. Same fucking shit. Cialis Dallas. No, 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 no. We still we still got our manhood together. Exactly. All exactly. right. Let's let's try to keep that's why we're getting right. Get right so we can get right. We're taking out your himbe. <laughs> <laughs> Internet, listen, Sawuchi. at Jason Maiden on Twitter, at uh, Jason Maiden on Instagram. Thank this guy for all these gems. But you know what? More importantly, don't only really thank him. Go ahead out there and use it. Use it in your life. Let yeah. somebody else know. Help, help, help the community. Help yourself. Help those around you. Like we always say, teach the youth or pay it forward. You'd be surprised. You don't have to be a millionaire to pay it forward. Mm-mm. You know, you can learn a lot from this. But anyway, listen, Jason, 
Appreciate you stopping by. Yes, sir. Internet, Jason sir. made it. Yep. Cheer. Los See you next internet guys. <laughs> internet, if you like that episode of the Premium Pete Show, I want you to tweet me, Instagram me, at Premium Pete, at the Premium Pete Show. Let me know what you thought. And I'll tell you one thing. All my big businesses, small businesses, mom and pop shop, whatever. You got a product, you got a brand, you want to advertise on the Premium Pete Show, email the Premium Pete Show at gmail.com. Again, that's the Premium Pete Show at gmail.com. Let's get to working and make sure you subscribe, rate, tell a friend. You can find us on all streaming podcast platforms, but make sure you rate, subscribe, leave a comment, tell a friend to tell a friend, and we'll see you next episode. Cheers.